Good morning. I hope that you are able to listen to me and to see me and all the members of the community, of our community, I hope, can hear me and everybody else who's interested in this topic that we're going to discuss today. The year is almost over. This year has been the year of the Lithuanian Jewish history and the Vilna Gaon. Unfortunately, we have the pandemic and a lot of events did not take place. However, at the end of the year, we have made a decision to finalize the year with a conference. And first of all, I would like to thank everyone who has organized this conference. The conference uh, was organized together with the Department of Ethnic Minorities. And I would like to apologize, Ms. Vida Montvedaite, for, uh, for not including her uh, scientific degree uh, next to her surname. She's a doctor, Vida Montvedaite. I would like to thank uh, the Lithuanian Institute of uh, History that agreed uh, to cooperate in organizing this conference. We are the Lithuanian Jewish community. We're an NGO which, uh, you, which you don't need to become a member of or, or to step, step into this organization or step out of this organization. Everybody who can be a member of this community. N not all historians, not all uh, lawyers, but a lot of people who are interested in these topics. And, uh, and I think, in general, people uh, uh, who are Jews uh, living in Lithuania should be interested in this conference. The Jewish history has been analyzed for a number of years and it has been uh, analyzed in terms of the relationship between the Jews and, uh, and, and Lithuanians. It's important for us. It's important for us, I mean, uh, uh, it's important for us how the government uh, views us, not only the Jews who uh, are in, like, in, who belong to certain in public institutions, but also to the Jews who do not belong to any public uh, institutions. I'm very glad that in our conference we have uh, scientists, uh, uh, among which we have Professor Gidu Shilekis and Professor Gidu Zilinskas, who are prominent lawyers, uh, professors of law. So I think that, uh, I hope that the audience will have a lot of questions and it will be very interesting for me uh, to share my insights and to receive answers uh, from, uh, from lawyers of such a high competence. Uh, I would be very grateful if I can get the answers to the questions that I have. So I would like to wish everyone a lot of success in this conference. I would like to thank everyone who has contributed in organizing this conference. I would like to also mention Sergeius Kanovicius and the organizations that are managed by him, uh, which also uh, helped organizing this conference. Unfortunately, Mr. Sergeius Kanovicius couldn't make it today to the conference. I would like to wish everyone productive, interesting work at today's conference, and maybe at the end of the conference we will decide to e include uh, uh, the talks uh, that are delivered in this conference into a certain publication, so that uh, so we have a kind of a, a publication, a written word that will, uh, that we will have for the future. And 
I would like to end my opening speech with the with a quote of the Vilna Gaon. I quote: "Let the solitude be uh, your fence. Don't leave home only for charity or for religious purposes, and, oh, and go to the synagogue only for a short." time. So you can see that Gaon's words written 300 years ago are so relevant today. And today, uh, but today we have technologies that enable us without leaving home to share our ideas and to discuss, uh, to have discussions on very interesting topics. So I wish you a lot of luck today. Um, I would like to thank the Lithuanian Jewish community and the Lithuanian Institute of History for giving me this opportunity um, to participate today. And for all of those um, who really worked on this event, I know a lot of work went into it. Um, we are proud to celebrate Vilna Gaon and to celebrate um, the history of Lithuania's Jewish community. This history is a part of the deep bonds between the United States and Lithuania that bond obligates us to protect the truth, to examine critically our past and ourselves. No country's history is without dark moments and we cannot succeed in the future when we do not understand our past. As we celebrate the past, the present and the future of Lithuania's Jewish heritage, we must also commit to defending the truth. We must never tolerate willful ignorance or distortion of history let us take the occasion of the year of Vilna Gaon as a moment to recommit ourselves to that effort. Lastly, I would like to say a very happy Hanukkah to all of our friends and colleagues in Lithuania and around the world who will be lighting candles tomorrow evening. I hope we can be together in person again soon. Thank you so much, Faina. Thank you so much to all of the organizers. And I hope you have a very good event today. Good morning. I would like to congratulate uh, all of the participants today who have uh, gathered here uh, in Lithuania as well as abroad this event as uh, the head of the Lithuanian Jewish com community, uh, Ms. Faina Kuklanski has mentioned, was organized uh, in the framework of uh, the Lithuanian government's decision to uh, commemorate, uh, to dedicate this year to the Vilna Gaon. This year has been a very interesting year, very weird, so to say, year. But all our ideas uh, uh, are being implemented. So I would like to use this opportunity to invite all the speakers, all the participants of the conference to continue meeting up because uh, people re throughout this year uh, really miss uh, this kind of events, th this kind of conferences that are organized by the acad academic world, by scientists. And I would like to invite everyone to dedicate more attention to meetings with teachers, to people who who would like to participate in uh, similar conferences after work, online, uh, and uh, as the Department of Ethnic Minorities, uh, we see a mission in it. Uh, we want to help Lithuanians uh, know better, know more about uh, ethnic groups in Lithuania, about the situation of ethnic groups, to analyze various issues, uh, whether they are painful or not to us. And we are ready uh, to, we are ready to, to give information, organizational support to all the researchers, to all scientists in organizing meetings, remote meetings, and in developing awareness of uh, how complex and interesting uh, 
the history of different nations in Lithuania was. And today this uh, event is dedicated to the Lithuanian Jews' uh, history, history and today. Uh, so it's dedicated to discuss various aspects of the Lithuanian Jews. Uh, so I would like to thank the Lithuanian Jews, Jewish community for organizing this conference in such a, a complicated circumstances. And I would like to wish productive work to everyone. Participants of the Lithuanian Jewish History Modern Directions uh, Scientific Discussion. On behalf of uh, researchers and all uh, Lithuanian uh, historians, uh, uh, to thank the Lithuanian Jewish community to, uh, for uh, cooperating in uh, commemorating the Vilna Gaon year. I'm convinced that the importance of the historic events uh, reveals itself in a relationship with today. Uh, five panels, five discussions uh, today, uh, as uh, Ms. Faina Kuklanski has said, has pulled uh, many researchers, the elite of uh, culture, academic world, uh, and researchers in Lithuania, and it reveals one thing. And this thing is that it's the Lithuanian Jewish history. It's so important to us. It's a part of the. It's an integral part of uh, our culture. I would like to wish everyone fruitful discussions that open new perspectives. And I would like to announce that at ten o'clock we will start the discussion. Uh, which is called Facing the Thresholds of Historiography, Public Historical S Culture and Historical Policy while reflecting on the history of Lithuanian Jews. And uh, the moderator of this discussion. Good morning. We are about to start. the first session, the first debate of our conference, which is intended for the for the history of society, for social policy of, of uh, uh, and historical aspects. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce um, the participants of this debate. Four doctors of history, doctors of arts, uh, and I am uh, the moderator of this debate. So let us start from Dr. Aglebendikaite, who has defended her doctor's thesis in 2004 and works for the Lithuanian History Institute of History. She uh, is an expert of Zionist history in Lithuania and she has issued a number of publications in uh, English and German. She teaches Yiddish and Lithuanian Jewish history, and one of her last works in English that is aimed for Jacob Robinson. Good morning once again, Agle. And now we'll have two historians of a different generation from Vilnius University. First of all, Dr. Aquilia Noujunenia, who has defended her doctor's thesis just uh, six months ago. And she graduated from, and she also teaches there. Uh, she also works for the Yiddish uh, Research Center. And she focused on minority of how minorities are reflected in, in textbooks, in school textbooks. And she also focuses on the aspects of uh, historical didactics in, in minorities, education of minorities. And then I would like to say good morning to Stanislav Stasulis. He is the graduate of Vilnius University. Uh, 
and he has defended his doctor's thesis uh, roughly two years ago. His dissertation, his uh, uh, doctor's thesis focused, um, sorry, I could not hear the topic because of, of technical problems. Um, the sound is not consistent, I'm sorry. He now currently works at the Vilna Gaon Museum of Jewish History. Together with other uh, associates, he has worked on a number of papers on the Holocaust. And another uh, speaker and panelist, that is Dr. Hector Svitkus, who has graduated from Klaipeda University and now works at the Institute of Baltic Region History and Archaeology. I'm sorry, but the internet connection is poor and the sound quality is not persistent. So we had an idea of, of having several rounds and discussing certain uh, key aspects that we are focusing in this debate. The questions uh, that arise when we talk about the professionals and experts in the public uh, area and certain issues that arise in, in more specialized circles uh, relating to Jewish issues. And the public, which uh, often uh, mm, receives everything rather passively. And also we will address certain political issues. Maybe we will not have enough time to uh, discuss all these levels, but certainly the most important thing is to highlight the problems that, that we face by researching and analyzing these issues and by observing the work of other uh, experts. One of the most important issues that we have in Lithuania and that we lack in Lithuania, that is a lack of self-reflection and criticism because sometimes uh, publications are uh, uh, written but, you know, we often lack time for self-reflection and criticism. So I think this event, uh, the events like this are a very uh, good opportunity to reflect on what has been done and achieved. So I will start with those questions that I already asked you to, to think about. So the first is... Uh, What problems arise for you personally and what do you think that problems arise when we address the topic of, of Jewish minority in Lithuania and other issues? And what are the ways of, of overcoming those problems as far as you see? So Agla, maybe you could start. I have read the question a number of times in terms of those professionals or experts, but I think it is not fully um, politically correct. You know, do you refer pro um, to professionals as those who hold uh, the, the diploma of the historian? But I think we should rather speak about the players uh, who act in that field of research. So I would like to separate two areas, the popular history and the academic history uh, areas. And each of those areas have their own problems to deal with. And some of them overlap, some of them collide in, in certain points. But if I may, I am a researcher of, of, of a former generation. So we have already... Uh, had 30 years of independent Lithuania and the history of Jews in Lithuania, we have been researching it for some 30 years. So when those research started, so 
we have immediately diagnosed the problem that there are two ways of, of talking about the Jewish history. One is that the internal presentation of Jewish history. Another thing is uh, talking about Jews from uh, the non-Jewish background, so that so-called external narrative. So we have observed this threshold uh, or this uh, difference uh, rather soon. And unfortunately, we did not manage to overcome it over the third period of 30 years. And this is how we keep talking and telling the, uh, about the Jewish history. Uh, the uh, well uh, research trends were uh, determined by attempts to cover up certain gaps in, in in Jewish history but in essence all the research started to focus on uh, the relations, on relations with Jews, on the Lithuanian approach to Jews, on Lithuanians, how they relate to, to Jews and etc. Of course, uh, the topics got uh, narrower, more, and some even started dealing with very niche aspects, uh, but still, um, well, we no longer make certain very general conclusions. We focus on more specific issues, uh, or on more specific aspects. We look deeper into the problems, but still it does not bring us closer to this internal Jewish history. And there were a number of reasons for that. I will probably not tell anything new by saying that Lithuanian Jewish history if we are not talking about f our foreign colleagues, the Jews, but uh, Lithuanian Jewish history has been written by Lithuanians only. Certainly, we face certain objective obstacles in this, the lack of sources, of uh, surviving or remaining sources, then we have this linguistic barrier of analyzing those sources and to un in order to understand all, all the environment, all, all the circumstances surrounding the situation. And eventually, in, from the academic perspective, that is the mental threshold, the mental barrier that we can get closer, but we cannot step over. We can get over it. We can not overcome it completely. Coming very close to reality, or how close to reality, we can represent this internal narrative of Jewish history. Um, you know, those people were brought up in a diff different cultural media uh, and uh, they grew up in a different epoch and era. So I think these are the main uh, issues, the main aspects that we uh, deal with when we talk about Lithuanian Jewish history. Of course, Lithuanian Jewish history, I think, was mostly oriented towards, well, the consumers. We see more interest in Lithuanian Jewish history now. And this interest and... Uh, and this curiosity uh, and uh, willingness to learn is much higher now. But I think uh, all those initiatives that emerge, they somehow stumble and then we ha need to talk over and over again about uh, certain things we that have been addressed in millions of times. So. Uh, we need to repeat those very basic truths or basic facts. So, you know, it ends up with very general basic knowledge. And, uh, you know, so we mainly uh, get our knowledge through our, uh, through food, uh, through synagogues and cemeteries. 
let's say it all ends up uh, by discovering your uh, geneal genealogical roots in some shtetl of Lithuania. So if we refer to this as a barrier, then we need to come up with certain mediation um, environment, mediation aspect, so that we would present an information in a way so that it would be more attractive and more interesting. So I think that would be my brief presentation. I think you have already addressed three issues at, this, uh, at the same time, that professional historiography, uh, those professionals who are not researchers but work in the education area, and, and the number of those recipients of our information. Aquila, what do you think? Can you react and respond? Um, I think that this communication among the professionals and uh, and communication of professionals uh, with the society is not an easy task e even though if we talk about other professionals let's say uh, the explorers of new or the history of new times still face many problems when they start talking about the history or v about very recent history or let's say the beginning of 20th century and etc so it is often different uh, difficult to overcome various stigma and aquila so now what is your perspective good morning everyone i would really to reflect on what um Agla Bendikaita has said, uh, I would like to agree with what has been said. Uh, while listening to you, I noticed that I have uh, been nodding my head. So uh, I, I really agree with, with what you have said. And that's one of the problems, uh, one of the issues that today I wanted to identify as problems in the academic field. Uh, the problems that are discussed uh, among the academic uh, community. And this is, uh, uh, there's a lack of discussion, lack of communication, uh, because there's a very uh, a small number of uh, researchers who address this issue uh, cross-sectionally. And we see that uh, um, we can only see agreeing, like pe pe researchers would usually agree with each other, and that's the predominant phenomenon. And the discussion, academic discussion, um, except for the Holocaust uh, research, uh, which, which needs a separate discussion. So uh, the academic discussion about the Litvak uh, uh, history is not there. And uh, even if we have this discussion, this discussion takes place between academics and those who uh, popularize history, uh, educators, uh, teachers. What does that mean? It usually means that researchers who uh, who analyze, and that's one uh, that's another problem which I wanted to identify. So, researchers who uh, speak mm, um, not very specifically, they don't represent themselves as the researchers of Jewish history. Uh, they re represent themselves in a more general way. They like represent themselves as researchers of, let's say, political movements in Lithuania of the 19th century and and uh, so on. So they are not uh, linked this area. So their research are not linked to the research of history of Jewish history. So it means that we see a separation between the research of Lithuanian history and the research of the Lithuanian Jewish history. Although these areas, these realms, have uh, really overlap, especially at the beginning of, let's say, the 20th century, if we talk about political or cultural areas. And only recently we have seen a kind of a specialization of research uh, of Litvaks, where Lithuanian Jews are not uh, considered only as the Jewish diaspora community, but the uh, the uniqueness of Litvak culture is is uh, is analyzed, is is dealt with, and the most prominent example for me. Uh, 
is the, uh, the most recent initiative of the Gona Museum, that is the a new department of the museum for the Litvak culture. So it's a, an attempt to step out of uh, the limits of the Lithuanian Jewish history and to uh, have a look at the Litvak history in a broader perspective. Uh, without, of course, uh, uh, w w including, of course, the Lithuanian um, element. And I think these problems uh, uh, are very important, uh, uh, not only for the academia, but also for education at schools. Education at schools is the topic that really interests me. And what do we see here? And as, as Professor Bendikaita has identified, um, the, the issue is that teachers very often uh, address the Jewish history uh, through the food culture, uh, folk, folklore culture. So they only uh, touch upon the topics that are interesting, that are very pleasant, nice. So. It's okay that teachers speak about what they were interested in. Uh, there is a higher uh, chance that uh, they will stir interest in children as well. But what does it create? What environment does it create? It means that we start talking about the Lithuanian Jewish history as the niche history, as, 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 as an area that is very interesting, as, as an area that is uh, um, as, as a kind of an exotic uh, niche of, 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 of our history. Uh, it may seem that the Lithuanian Jewish history is uh, somewhere in the margin, and Lithuanians, it may seem, uh, uh, children might get an impression that Lithuanians and Jewish had like separate histories. So uh, these, uh, we can see these problems in academic world and also in educational world. That is the, the inability to see the Jewish history, Lithuanian Jewish history, and the general history context. So that these would be my main insights. Thank you very much. Uh, exclusion. Can can you uh, explain this exclusion with a lack of sources, maybe? Uh, the, if we have a look at the sources that were left by different conf confessions and, and nationalities, so uh, probably that would be one of the reasons. So, uh, on the micro history level, uh, it, it, it has uh, it's it's important. Uh, another aspect is important. We have f like five people here in the panel who. Mm, uh, deal with uh, the Jewish history, and we have another five uh, in, in the following section. How many of us deal with the catastrophe uh, research? Pro I mean, professionals. They all and all of them work in one institution. Their research is not problematic, but that institution is problematic. Uh, so we have to we have a situation where. Uh, uh, the consensus uh, that is uh, that we use when we talk about the Jewish history and how the education works and what people are interested in, like edu education, uh, th that's one world, and a, a totally different thing uh, is um, the situation is totally different when it comes to to the to the tragedy. And we have probably to identify that we have have two different fields that do not really overlap. Stanislavos, what do you think? You have this insider perspective, so what do you think about this? Uh, Nerius, uh, your, your question, I mean, I, I thought you, you cannot make it an absolute question. We have historians, uh, history professionals, and uh, historians uh, themselves, uh, due to the manage the pressure of management, due to their institutions that they work with, they they mm, they take on a, a specific discourse. Uh, mm, uh, of course, professionals are. Professional historians uh, work with sources every day. They read them, they analyze them, they compare them, they read what other historians have written. But when it comes to uh, separate groups of uh, 
of speakers, I would say that uh, we have historians whose field has certain problems uh, and faces certain problems uh, that were identified by uh, Dr. Bendikaita, that is, let's say, the language barrier. Uh, for example, me. Uh, I started studying Yiddish after my dissertation, which uh, probably I should have done before uh, the dissertation. And when you start analyzing the sources in Yiddish about Holocaust, for example, uh, you then see um, totally different angles and details open up in front of you that you haven't seen before. So you can analyze uh, things from various perspectives. Uh, another uh, group of people are uh, public people or, or writers, of, let's say Marusi Vashkavichus, who uh, are very good at diagnosing certain problems uh, in society, but they are not professional historians. They do not analyze, they do not uh, work with archives. Yet another group of people uh, could be called... Uh, uh, people who pop, uh, popularize history, as Bendikaita, Dr. Bendikaita has referred to. And I would say that there has to be a certain uh, intermediary between academic world and society. Someone, some people who would be able to uh, present the academic material in a popular way. Uh, however, Sometimes we can see that it becomes very cliche, very primitive, a, a very cl cliche and primitive discourse where only famous uh, surnames are emphasized, uh, let's say Bob Dylan, uh, who, have, who are of uh, the Litwak descent. Uh, however, a lot of other uh, prominent names uh, of Litvaks who uh, are forgotten in, in their perception of uh, society. They, they, they are not emphasized, not stressed. So I would identify three problems. Uh, the academic world, maybe due to financial uh, situation, the production, um, the, the books, uh, the publications of the academic world sometimes do not reach uh, society or they're not uh, disseminated on such a large scale. Uh, public personalities, uh, uh, who talk about the painful moments of the society, they do not do research. And, uh, and, and people who popularize history, they try uh, to uh, talk about uh, painful topics such as Holocaust in a popular way, which is a good thing, but sometimes the problem is that it's done in a very primitive way. And that's, I think, is a problem. Thank you. Uh, when, when we speak that, uh, uh, that uh, yes, uh, about this um, presentation of history, that might be the fact that historians just simply don't know how to write attractively. Uh, another issue is that a lot of uh, a lot of people, uh, layman, I mean, society simply buys uh, historic uh, historical books and and they they simply do not read them. They they, they are in the shelves, but they never open them up. Uh, when it comes to writing, yes, we uh, we. Um, can, we, we can see increasingly more publications and writing, and as well as speaking, uh, the discourse is, is, is becoming more um, ubiquitous. Hectoras, what do you think? What is your experience? Uh, you're from another part of Lithuania, from Klaipeda, um, and maybe you have other things, um, maybe you see other aspects, other things. Uh, maybe in your university, you... Uh, you, you you face different problems. Well, uh, I was just thinking about how to squeeze everything in several minutes because I could talk on and on. Uh, I would 
I would probably take on the role of uh, an observer from a province, <laughs> a provincial, in the central discourse that is being shaped uh, here today uh, by not only Vilnius uh, scientific institutions or specialized research centers, but also uh, by KONAS. Uh, uh, universities such as Vitutas Magnus University and certain uh, other institutions. How does that look like from a region, like Klaipa, the region? Well, I, I have uh, certain observations as well. Uh, Agle has expressed an idea that um, that the Lithuanian Jewish history, not necessarily the history of Litvaks, uh, Litvaks, the history of uh, who are Lithuanian Jews and who are Litvaks. I also face this problem very frequently because we have uh, stereotypical, very narrow uh, perceptions of the Lithuanian Jews, uh, uh, or, you know, they are within the limits of uh, Lithuania. But when we start talking about Litvaks, so we, when we, uh, then, then it turns out that uh, that uh, regionally and mentally and in all other aspects, like culturally, and, and socially, uh, the, this is a much broader uh, area. So if we speak about the Lithuanian Jewish history or the Lithuanian Litvak history is written only by Lithuanian authors or only uh, Lithuanian historians, uh, um, I, I really doubt this uh, because... Uh, uh, um, because then I think about several dozens of uh, publications, research articles, academic books, which are actually not read by society. Uh, for example, Ruth Lizarovic. We can we can, we can mention this author. So, uh, Joachim Joachim Tauber. Uh, maybe they speak about certain periods, let's say, interwar Holocaust context. And another thing is that uh, recently I have uh, I have noticed um, I have a suspicion, and time will show whether my suspicion is uh, is true. But I um, I get an impression that uh, regional uh, communities of Litvaks, uh, regional Jewish communities, uh, uh, I'm talking about the Klaipa, the uh, region situation claim that the Jewish communities uh, were formed from different branches and we can't talk about uh, a homogeneous uh, community and that's the 19th century context especially the second half of the 19th, 19th century so here uh, I would think I, I would say and coming back to the a problem that was uh, identified by the moderator. I would also mention other professionals uh, uh, who specialize in a certain area. And I would also mention a lot of uh, regional museums and the employees, the staff of these museums. Um, a person, let's say, a, a, a museum, um, uh, professional. I mean, they they, they, they uh, become interested in the topic and they become professionals. Actually, not only uh, popularizers of of history, but uh, and as far as I've seen, um, what their work, let's say, people who work at the museums, is as difficult as uh, the one that is done by historians. They have to analyze and verify sources. Uh, the their job is also also complex, uh, but very interesting. Remembrance institutions, archives, yeah, so in, in a regional context, that's also important. Let's say Telche, um, uh, for example, Klepe, the regional archives, uh, Talshi uh, branch, so, and, and we have other other institutions, mediators, uh, the group of mediators. Um, I'm, I'm referring to certain uh, media groups, uh, not only central um, or national media, uh, uh, which is very difficult to define. For example, Delphi news portal. Is it a is it a national? Uh, media or 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 not, 
Uh, but when we talk about the regional uh, issues, uh, the interest uh, uh, interest has been going up uh, for the last two or three years. This year, it's, it's it makes sense because this year is uh, the Vilna Gaon year and uh, the year of the Lithuanian Jewish history. So the interest, it's well, we can say that there's a boom of uh, interest and. Uh, 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 when it comes to professional groups, we have also other very interesting groups of professionals, which sometimes are forgotten. And as historians, we have to admit that uh, we have neglected these groups of people. For example, tour guides. Uh, recently, I have been working with tour guides and uh, with their programs, and they they develop certain texts. Uh, and uh, that they use during their tours and of course uh, because of the pandemic uh, it's not very uh, well we, we don't um, the tour guides are not really working right now but uh, but we can see uh, certain programs that are prepared by groups like Mamel Yudin um, let's say uh, they have meetings with uh, um, descendants of the Memel Luden were organized, and uh, as far as I have seen, how tour guides work uh, with uh, w with uh, tourists, let's say, I would say tour guides are also professionals. They are professionals who use the product, uh, the products, or the discourse uh, produced by other professionals. Um, let's say historians, uh, specialized centers. So the problem um, that was uh, identified by uh, my colleagues uh, in this panel, this, um, this gap between academic discourse and non-academic discourse, uh, the extent to which it's popular or not, so this gap, yes, it does exist. But on the other hand, Um, to what extent the historians should blame themselves? I don't know. Um, I don't know if historians should blame themselves for not being able to uh, present their, um, their research findings in a popular way. I would say that uh, uh, other professional groups uh, that I've mentioned can do that in a quality way using their own methods. That would be my... Uh, um, insights. Thank you. So we have discussed our first question or the problems that professionals face. It, 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 certainly, the circle of our colleagues is is, is much broader and and uh, and. It, if I reiterate what Hector Svitko say, as we go deeper into the discussion, we see more and more those issues. Maybe uh, our society beca becomes more segregated and, and uh, uh, more complicated. But looking from the point of view of, of uh, learning uh, about Jewish culture, you know, when you start from point zero, any continuation in time gives a certain tangible result. And then, of course, you have to specialize in one area or the other. So uh, I think what is more important that Hector noticed uh, that People who work in museums, such as Stan, uh, like Stanislavas, you know, they may be professionals or not, but they are very valid, ed educated, intelligent people who know more about Jewish history. It may be a writer or a creator or maybe uh, uh, an expert in some other professional field. But uh, the most important point is that they would have knowledge and willingness to share it. So the uh, layer of those people who have knowledge is much more important then uh, and i think we even had some called uh, chamber events and i think there was some kind of competition m among those who had the knowledge and those who researched certain fields 
So, uh, um, when professional mediators and communicators start talking, so then we have uh, different issues. So now I'd like to switch to our second question. So where we have uh, those so-called observers uh, or the, the part of the society who listen, observe, analyze and question certain issues. Uh, do you think how many people, what is the share of, of people in Lithuania who care about Jewish history, who uh, care, uh, who interact with it somehow, who try to learn about Jewish history? How conscious are they in, in, in respect of your Jewish history? So... Maybe let us start with Agla. I think I have touched upon this issue when addressing the first uh, issue, that the history it, itself is oriented towards the consumers or recipients, so we know the needs. So we often uh, simply standing stand and stumble in the same place, uh, we repeat the same terms and the same facts, but we should start thinking about the form of how to present. Yes, there are uh, many more writings, many more uh, publications, but the reading culture uh, is not growing, is not improving. Nobody is uh, prepared to read those texts and to interpret and to analyze them and to d discuss about those texts in order to contribute to the pub to progress in, in public uh, narrative, uh, public discourse. So that is my observation. Depending on the context, I think, mm, well, over the past six months, there was a lot of talk about, well, everything. We live in the era of social bubbles uh, and uh, social segregation. And uh, sometimes different opinions are not tolerated. Uh, So those talks over the recent years, uh, there were some successful projects implemented, there were some successful uh, narratives, some of them were not so successful. Uh, Let's say if we talk about the popular press, the popular media, there were a number of projects in the regional projects as well. Sometimes it seemed to me that those uh, texts were simply reissued, reformulated without providing any new facts, any new aspects, and sometimes uh, they mm, were not uh, very relevant and they were only focusing about uh, uh, relations between men and women and not certain, let's say, regional uh, issues of original Jewish history. So that is a, a short example. What other tiny aspect I have seen? So what texts, uh, well, cause certain reactions or certain repercussions? Most often, we need to start reading the comments uh, of the articles and where we see uh, there are no changes in the mentality over those 30 years of freedom. It may, the topic may be totally neutral, let's say it may be a certain cultural event or economic aspect, and still we will end up uh, you know, fighting and blaming uh, who did what and why they, uh, somebody did something. So this is my short summary of, of what reactions in the society are and how it receives academic texts. Uh, before I pass the floor to Aquila, 
Well, this concern whether Lithuanian people are not very well aware of the topic. And do you think it, it, it really relates to this topic in particular, or it is, well, generally uh, characteristic? Let's say we had carried out a survey a couple of years ago, and, and we collected roughly 1,000 questionnaires. So I think that Lithuanian people are not very conscious in historic terms, well, historically. Some people are interested in certain topics, but, well, you know, they say that, oh, Lithuanian people are very in much interested in Lithuanian history, but except for this topic. But no, I don't think so. I think that people are simply not uh, interested sufficiently in Lithuanian history, and their opinions are mm, uh, very uh, superficial. They are not based on, on serious reading and on serious facts. So instead of that historical uh, consciousness, we have this um, some mythical or political consciousness that uh, that is something that can be related to modern politics, and um, we don't really talk much about what happened in the past. So uh, you know, certain facts from Lithuanian history can uh, can be turned into myths uh, uh, just the way it can be done with the Lithuanian Jewish history. So I think it does not relate to any social uh, contradictions and conflicts. So I, I think we should not make this social division here. So, Aquila, what is your perspective? What is your impression on this? Well, I have a number of impressions. It's difficult to uh, uh, conclude and then to sum it up. You know, I, I have to move quite often from this academic sphere to, to this popular history sphere. So, just like Dr. Vitko said, It is very important to focus on popular history and to share your knowledge in one way or the other, because there is a need and there is some curiosity in the public. And you very rightly noticed guides who are our main listeners. If we talk about, you know, uh, public lectures uh, and educational tours. So in terms of those who listen, what impression I get? I think we cannot be very categoric and to say that, you know, many from the Jewish, Lithuanian Jewish community listen, but not all of them, or many f from those who are interested in the Holocaust history and not everyone. So, you know, everywhere you can add this not everyone or not all so those groups are of course differentiated but what we can clearly see i think the uh, interest in the holocaust topic has intensified uh, recently and it is much mm, well there's much more interest in this topic, and numerous events uh, show that the Vilnius Public Library organizes various events, not only on the Holocaust, but uh, they also have lectures about the Jewish history, not only Lithuanian Jewish history, about the, uh, the history of the Jewish diaspora. And people who attend those events are usually, is, well, a very small group and they, um, usually the same people come to to those events. But let's say six years ago, we had an event on a broad analysis of the Holocaust topics where we had not only uh, 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 academicians, but also had people from different walks of life, uh, those people who were referred to as those who popularize history. So it was a very popular attention which received a lot of uh, uh, event, which uh, attracted a lot of attention. And not even everyone could get into uh, the event. So we can see that those topics of the Holocaust and uh, 
is uh, more and more popular. Well, the question is why it is so. And the moderator, I think, rightly noted that this topic uh, relates uh, to the present. And I, when I talk, uh, when I refer to present, I mean the entire history of Lithuania's 20th century, which uh, painfully um, affected uh, not only the Jewish community in Lithuania, but also other ethnic minorities in Lithuania. And it encourages um, interest in, in uh, the Holocaust in Lithuania. Sometimes people simply attend various debates and listen to lectures, and we don't really know how much people read about the topic. We cannot, well, assess this. But in terms of academic interest, to be more specific, I always want to base myself on, on uh, specific examples. So in Vilnius University, in the Faculty of History, We always, we always have very few students who would be interested in the Jewish history. And we simply have individual cases. And it, mostly they are interested in uh, the, that part of history which is easily available to, well, where, where access to sources is, is where you don't need to know any knowledge of Hebrew or Yiddish. And those listeners usually focus on the topic of Holocaust as a topic where you can find a wide uh, array of, of sources in, in Lithuanian, uh, Russian, and Polish. So uh, they limit themselves uh, due to their linguistic restrictions. And I think that is pretty clear and evident. So I will not go deeper into details. So if we talk about students, uh, and when you read the master thesis now, many of them focus on topics where you where they need Russian or Polish. Most uh, of students focus, of course, on on the resources available in Lithuanian language, and I think that is uh, a pretty uh, popular trend now. And if we talk about the Vito Tas Magnus University in particular, let's say many people seek for this so-called convenience and they only want to read sources in, 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 Lithu in the Lithuanian language. And that is, well, pretty natural wish of, 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 of modern people to have a comfortable life. I'm not sure whether that is an obstacle, a problem, or a... And they can only analyze uh, complicated issues of our society uh, to the level, uh, you know, when they are really simplified. And when we speak about broader levels, you know, so they are close to professionals. So we don't have this uh, transitional or intermediary part who would be interested, you know. But you have uh, mentioned one of those uh, target groups, uh, people. who uh, speak about war with, with this element of uh, shame or humility. It may be rejected or accepted, uh, but it's still um, presented through certain per personal aspects. They become more standardized and universal. This is why you attract people who have no knowledge at all about the Jews, their life and their history in this way, then you certainly focus on the Holocaust, you get, get to this so-called Holocaust-centered um, aspect. I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but this is, you know, as if an attempt to attract people's interest at any cost. What is interesting to me, what people uh, remember, what people uh, um, get, what people learn from those books, what, what uh, they read, you know. Sometimes I think that people simply focus on, on certain very uh, 
awkward, uh, non-important, very trivial facts, and they uh, mm, keep telling and retelling it like it was the most important message and news. What is your view uh, about the society, Mr. Uh, Stasilis? Yes, we see this interest in, in uh, the Jewish history, in the Holocaust history, but when you take a look at certain discussions uh, and public debates uh, and public reactions uh, referring to those who took part in, in Soviet resistance and etc., so then you immediately see that there's no equality in assessing the, the crimes of the Soviet regime and the crimes of Nazis, of Nazi occup occupation. As to the uh, rising interest, I think we could also speak about several groups, but we shouldn't generalize, let's say. The teachers themselves, they are very much interested and they bring many uh, students, uh, many children to the museum. I wouldn't like to generalize, but sometimes teachers who come with children ask very awkward questions and it seems that you know students are much better educated about the holocaust a holocaust and know much more about the topic i also have to agree with what hector said in a way uh, we also have the regions let's say our museum receives a lot of requests from regional museums and from individuals who ask let's say i'm writing i'm telling you about uh, the history of, of kudirkanomias this a sh brief history and where could i find the lists of those who were murdered who were killed or where i could find this or that information so these are simply individual uh, initiatives uh, of people but we get more and more the requests like this from various cities. So this shows rising interest and uh, understanding that when you write about certain region and certain small town, then you are not only writing about uh, Lithuanians or Lithuanian deportees, uh, we also include another group of people who lived in that small town, let's say, and that was killed. Well, maybe if we talk in the words of Nietzsche, both from the public, from the audience, and from professionals, that uh, perception of the past uh, manifests in different ways. You know, some who really care about uh, heroes or huge cra sacrifice, then they would receive history in one way. But if people care about small, tiny details and learning and understanding the situation in great detail, they they would focus on different aspects. You know. No matter where people live, but they are surrounded with information, and of course they need some uh, help from the prof from the professionals. Well, first of all, you pro you shouldn't probably go to archive, but you can ask the museum for help, which seems to have a more humane profile, more humane uh, face and m better structured information that is easier to understand for general audiences, for general public. So Hector, what is your impression on this aspect? Well, I see that we are threatened by the administrator of our meeting, so I will be very brief. In terms of re reactions, from my own experience, from my personal experience, to make a, our debate more lively and to conclude it on a, a more joyful note. I remember very well the fact that after I defended my doctor's thesis, I got a very interesting email which where I was uh, referred to as Shabiz Goy and etc. And I uh, would get a number of letters like this when I started writing my thesis and when I publicated various uh, scientific texts about uh, uh, the Holocaust, about the remembrance culture, etc. 
and recently for some four to five years i stopped receiving emails like that so i would dare to make a conclusion a preliminary conclusion that maybe those reactions are changing bit by bit maybe they are becoming more moderate or maybe they uh, are manifested as comments in, in those online portals and, and but I'm not lo no longer confronted with those factual uh, <laughs> information so there's no such strong reaction anymore okay so we managed to discuss several issues at the end um, I think I will respond to the question uh, why Lithuanian collective memory does not coincide with uh, with, the with the Jewish history. It's probably because remembrance and memory is something that lasts for a very short time. And we see this very badly damaged memory and we only by enriching it, uh, we can achieve and promote people, encourage people to look for um, information on the issues are really, that are really important and, and uh, painful. So thank you very much for your uh, participation in the debate. Th thank you for your m m interesting insights and for your preparation for, for this debate. Best of luck in all of your endeavors and thank you. Good morning. Dear panelists, welcome to the discussion, creating a general image of the old Lithuanian Jewish history challenges, works done further perspectives. I'm Violeta Davolut and I'm honored to moderate this discussion with four very competent participants who are influential constructors of the Lithuanian Jewish history and general image. We have 50 minutes for the discussions and 10 minutes for the questions. Let me, without further delay, introduce the participants of the discussion. I'll start with Professor Dr. Dr. Lara Lempertene, who is the head uh, of the Judaic uh, Department of the National Library of Lithuania, Martinas Majudas Library. Uh, she's a coordinator of uh, international events, uh, organizer of seminars, the curator of exhibitions. We also have uh, Professor uh, Jurgita Verbitskina of Vilnius University Faculty of History, uh, who is also uh, the head of the Department of, uh, of, of Eastern Jews. She uh, takes part in various projects. Uh, she's also the head of the uh, Jewish uh, heritage uh, uh, group. And we also have uh, a famous researcher, historian, uh, Dr. Darius Telunas. Dr. Darius Telunas uh, uh, has uh, researched anti-Semitism uh, during uh, tar uh, Tsarist era in the 20th also in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. He is also Lithuanian Studies Series uh, Chief Editor. That is the book uh, dedicated to Lithuanian history. We also have uh, Professor Vigantas Varikis uh, from Klaipeda University. He works in the Institute of Baltic Regional Region History and Archaeology. He uh, works in various uh, international projects and Lithuanian projects. He has researched uh, the, uh, the the relation, the issue of uh, uh, Lithuanians and Jews, uh, paramilitary issues, anti-Semitism history, and he has uh, uh, made a lot of. Uh, he has uh, supervised a lot of uh, research. Uh, studies that were carried out by young researchers. Dear all, as I've said, you are very important uh, generators of the image of Lithuanian Jewish uh, 
uh, history. How has it changed within the last 30 years? What are the most important guidelines of the change of the general image? Uh, what uh, was successful? Where do you think uh, we have made failures? I will start with Lara. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Violetta, when I received the questions from you previously, and I, I thought that I'm going to uh, use the opportunity to speak as non-professional historian, and I will say that uh, there are certain problems with the formulation, with the terminology itself. Uh, creating a general image uh, is a term that is a problematic for me. Uh, a more neutral term let's say, uh, the discourse or retelling history would be more neutral. And it's not influenced by a, a lot of factors. And I would feel more cozy, uh, more OK with it. And I would say that no matter how nicely the first term, creating a general image, uh, sounds, I think for me, uh, in the general uh, and in the academic disc d discourse, this term, creating a general image, I think it's it's understood very um, in a very in a very broad sense, and uh, it answers the second part of your question: so where we fail. I think we fail uh, in in a way that that we. I mean, the community that ha uh, that was discussed in the first uh, panel, the community of uh, professionals, educators, usually uh, in one person. The problem is that without having the understanding about the core, I mean, I'm, I'm referring to sources, about how sources tell their story in the language of the sources. So uh, with having so little connection with the sources of the Jewish history, we have too much of freedom. Uh, the Jewish term, Hefker, could be translated as nobodies. Uh, we have a very little critical mass I mean, I'm referring to people who could tell, uh, uh, who could tell the story. There is little uh, connection with the sources because, because we because of the language barrier. Then we have this area of hefker where we can act freely. There's the, and we can actually abuse it, and it's very often abused by professionals. And I think the. The, the image is constructed too loosely. Uh, within, the th within 30 years, uh, there have been a lot of uh, serious academic works done, and there's a lot of contribution of academics into research. But I think uh, we are now in, in a stage uh, where uh, academics, public personalities, artists, and the efforts of these people should be very well balanced so that we do not fall into the pit of healthcare. So these would be my preliminary remarks. Jurgita, uh, how could you reflect on the, um, on the developments uh, of the 30 years in creating the narrative, let's say, let's use the word narrative instead of uh, image. Uh, hello, everyone. I would like to talk about where the Jewish uh, studies begin. If we talk about the, if, if we talk about it in Lithuania, we have to ask the question: When did academic research start, and uh, what are the breaking points? Are we? lagging behind or are we ahead in terms of the if, if we in terms of the international context and uh, me and Larry really like this topic and uh, uh, the first big conference big event international event uh, that uh, transformed academia in Lithuania and the 
understanding of society in general in terms of the uh, Jewish uh, history. That was 1997, um, a conference of 1997, international conference, which was dedicated uh, to uh, well, go on as well. And that was like a, a starting point. And uh, we didn't have, by that time, a lot of historians who would specifically research the history of Jewish. And, uh, and this uh, event was very important. Another breaking point uh, is uh, um, happened a year after. Uh, Vilnius University and uh, Academia of C Catholics organized a conference in 1998 which raised the issues of Holocaust, anti-Semitism, and the Lithuanian Church. Quite a lot of a complex of uh, phenomena. And I know uh, that Vigant has participated in that conference. Uh, I was not invited to any of the conferences at the time. I didn't have even ambitions to participate in the conferences. So I was like a, an observer. I, I, I can evaluate these conferences as, obs and as, as an observer. So this 1999 AIDS conference was dedicated to uh, anti-Semitism and the relationship with the church. Uh, Solus Sujedilis was a uh, participant of this conference. So, uh, so uh, foreign researchers could speak about, uh, at this conference, about the 18th century, the 19th century, whereas Lithuanians talked about Holocaust, which is a political problem in, 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 in a way. Yet another breaking point, uh, um, uh, and we have to say that the Eastern Jewish uh, studies are, is not an old thing. Um, uh, they started about, this field started about two, in, in 2004, 2006. So we have, a, well, we started from nothing or almost from nothing. Um, we have a very complex history that we have to evaluate. So when it comes to the achievements uh, in the last 30 years, uh, I, I, would, um, I would be a bit more optimistic uh, about the situation. And I think that, and, and I'm very glad that we talk, uh, we're talking right now with the colleagues that we have uh, worked together. For example, me and Lara, we published a book which is called Jewish in, Jewish in Lithuania. This is a popular scientific book. Then with that Stelunas, we have a book there which is called Lithuanian Jews. This is a shift that allows us to speak uh, differently about how, how Lithuanians looked upon Jews, how Jews looked upon Lithuanians. We, uh, we, when it comes to terms, we talk about the Lithuanian Jews and uh, not Jews in Lithuania. That's important distinction. Another thing uh, which we will probably uh, not be able to uh, overcome because it's, it's in a political issue is uh, the understanding of the Lithuanian Grand Duchy as the country which was tolerant. So, so far, that would be it. Thank you. Lara mentioned cooperation, and Jurgita mentioned connections and links. So may I ask whether different institutions, research groups of researchers which address the topic, enthusiasts of in the education who are really engaged in this topic, and uh, do they cooperate all together, or is it still a very complicated communication and we are still segregated or if we have this uh, segregation so how we can improve this uh, pluralist communication and to improve the narrative so may I ask Darius first thank you I see that the moderator really got scared by the uh, situation that they had in the previous debate where they spoke a lot and, and uh, did not really have enough time to discuss everything. I will disobey and respond to question number one. 
because there's much to be said and what colleagues already had said. Question number one in terms of narrative. Well, it was uh, related not only to narrative and to achievements as well. If we talk of achievements, I think the metaphor of half full or a half empty glass is very, very good. You know, if we compare it to what we had in the Soviet era, so the situation is very good now. And if we compare to what we have now, and if we compare it to studies in Poland, or if we raise a simple academic questions, do our research uh, well correspond to those uh, academic uh, requirements? So the situation is pretty sad. And Lara pointed out the issues of competence. So these aspects were also addressed in the first debate by Agla Bendicator, then by other um, panelists. As to narratives, most texts don't re really produce any particular narrative. They can be combined in some, in some puzzle. But uh, there are two narratives, if I if put it simply. One narrative that prevails in, in the West, in the foreign countries, it is not dominant, but it is rather strong. That is an attempt to extrapolate the Holocaust situation into, into the past and to tell the story of Jews and, and Lithuanians, Christians, which eventually brought uh, to the consequence of the Holocaust. On the other hand, we have the so-called oppositional narrative, which reminds me of the Soviet concept of friendship of nations, how we all together live and cohabit uh, together beautifully, or we are all tolerant and enjoy beautiful life. Indeed, as professional historians, we try to picture it, it in a more complicated manner to show all the complex aspects. Where that image should be sought or where we should look for it, well, the main um, object of our research should be Well, uh, overall history of Lithuania, where we could see different cases where integration was more successful. In some cases, uh, uh, it seemed like uh, uh, mm, there was no integration at all. On the other hand, seeing all this narrative, uh, it was an attempt to write down the Jewish history in Lithuania, where we faced a number of problems. I will. Uh, finish speaking soon. So one aspect was the lack of, of professionalism, which we try to address by looking for corporations and collaborations. If you take a look at, at uh, the uh, list of literature, you will see that half of the authors are from abroad and half of the authors are Lithuanian. You know, maybe foreign professionals lack certain different competences than we do, so we try to address this lack of competences. Um, another problem that we had faced is how to define uh, the Jewish history in Lithuania, especially in those uh, periods when uh, Lithuanian state did not exist and the Jewish mental uh, map is totally different. Or... Um, different from the one that how we would like to describe Jewish history in the 19th century, let's say. We had the Polish Jews or the Russian Jews. We did not have any Lithuanian Jews in the 19th century. And that was a problem that we really find, found it hard to, to resolve. And I'm not sure if we even managed to resolve it. And now it's time to re respond to the last question. I think it is good that we don't have a single strategy and we don't have a, attempts to uh, 
produce a single narrative. I think the more competing stories we have, the more competing narratives we have, the better uh, the situation is. Thank you. Now, we should not discriminate and we should ask uh, the same question to the professor from Kleipedas University, Vigandas, what are your reflections on this issue? I would like to continue what uh, Jurgita Lara said. If we focus on Jewish history, on the research of Jewish history and the narratives, I would like to state that we did not really have the tradition, let's say, take uh, Poland, despite the fact that during the interwar period in Poland, the Jewish history was mainly anti-Semitic history, but they still had this uh, tradition of, of, of Jewish history. But in Lithuania, we did not really have any academic articles, any academic texts on the, on the topic. Take us a look at the period after 1945. It was, uh, well, totally terminated. There was a gap. The Jewish history was a taboo in the Soviet Union. And those who wanted to defend their doctoral thesis, uh, they could not really write uh, on the Jewish history. Or let's say people who wanted to write about the topic had to uh, face serious problems. So in Lithuania, we only have the, uh, an official narrative of, of, of uh, Soviet uh, soldiers who were shot down and, and the Holocaust, and that's it. And after 1980, the archives opened up. And the books that were not available, uh, we got access to those books, in, in, let's say, in English language. Uh, and uh, one of the books uh, was about the Vilnius ghetto in English, which I read with great interest. And uh, those, you know, uh, publications by uh, uh, migrant, uh, by by the by Jews who migrated, you know. Uh, one of the con first conferences was organized in 1989 uh, um, in the memory of Vilnius Ghetto, that, where after the conference a wide, beautiful book was published, which was a, a, a high, of high academic level. Many issues were raised in that book, book, and of course many of those issues haven't been answered still. Then we had the academic studies and various academic texts with, uh, which started. And then we had people who knew languages and, and who already could uh, interpret those new texts. The Holocaust studies in Lithuania is, well, are the most popular and that is the, the, the best researched area, I think. And we have quite some achievements in this area. In terms of institutional cooperation, I will tell you, I will be frank, you know, we all know each other, more or less. So there are so few of us who are seriously interested in, 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 in the Jewish history, in the Jewish research. You know, institutional and uh, human relations between the Lithuanian History Institute, between the Vilnius University and the Klaipeda University, we meet in various conferences quite often. As I go to the summary of, of my uh, we. Uh, of my speech, I would like to mention local or regional history studies, um, which are very useful and important. Let's say small uh, local museums organize various conferences where researchers uh, participate. Plungas Museum, Palanga Museum, Telche Museum, they have organized conferences uh, intended for Jewish history, for local Jewish history and uh, particular aspects uh, where, where they uh, publish uh, 
scientific level uh, publications after those conferences. So this is in terms of local communities, in, in, in terms of, of regional communities, um, where scientific papers are produced, not only some descriptive materials. Thank you very much. Now we have three terms, an image, a puzzle, uh, uh, and uh, narrative. So representatives of different institutions uh, ha have come together here in this discussion. What do you see? Some methodological clusters, some topical clusters in, 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 in research. How this topography of, of research institutions looks like, or what um, are specific features of, of those institutions, or don't you think they have certain specific aspects that well, could have emerged over the period of these 30 years of independence. Uh, may I start with Jurgita, please? Well, the question is not an easy one. I will also disobey the rules of the debate, just like everyone else, but I would like to touch upon to what my colleague has mentioned about the lack of competences. That is a very clear problem a very evident problem, but everyone who sits here in the discussion and those who attended the previous previous debate know that you know Jewish research is mainly done by people who were self-educated be, because they came to this area um, of their own natural interest. And Lara is also self-educated. So we all are, well, self-educated, self-made, self-taught researchers of Jewish history. Another very acute problem that we have in Vilnius University, and it hasn't been uh, addressed uh, on the Lithuanian level, that is a misunderstanding in a way, and a great problem in my view, that in we don't really have a Jewish history program in any of Lithuania's universities. So there's not even a opportunity provided to acquire formal education in Jewish history. So I simply thought of this, that we could have an inter-university of Lithuanian Jewish history program, and then we could achieve a more tangible result. Because, you know, when we prepare those professionals, so we, as self-taught experts and researchers of Jewish history, educate the future generation. So we all have our own students who already work in this area. So I think that institutions should cooperate and look for um, more links and connections. Because uh, uh, researching certain topics is not easy because they are broad and we need to specialize in certain areas. And there are, of course, certain sources that are only uh, accessible in Klaipeda University, but they are not available in Vilnius University, etc. So, research of the Lithuanian Jews of the uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania, that is rather specific of my uh, analysis, I think. So we don't really have alternatives, and there are only a few uh, Polish sources uh, where information can be found. The later the period is, the more researchers we have for this Jewish history. So without cooperation and collaboration, I think our activities are not possible. So now, 
what we have, I mean all the publications that we have for Jewish history, they are in a way collaborations with foreign uh, experts and professionals. And my question now is uh, how collaboration works and is it successful? Uh, I would like to ask Darius to uh, add a few words and to reflect on this. Well, I think I have no choice. I have to uh, um, uh, do what you say. Going back to the previous question of Violetta, do we have any diversity, any variety? So if we think of uh, this variety of topics, if we think of theoretical um, context, uh, methodology, methodology, and if we try to look for schools, so I don't really see any difference in between uh, among the institutions in Lithuania. I think there are no institutions who would only specialize in Jewish uh, history. So there, I think there are no major differences. And I will repeat myself in a way uh, about what colleagues said during the first debate. Analyzing the topics uh, which uh, publications are being written on, and, and I think that the, this range of topics is uh, pretty narrow. Uh, politi policy of one or the other state, uh, violence, and uh, the Holocaust. So it's all those, all those external picture of Jewish history in Lithuania. But the so-called internal picture is not really available and we can't really uh, describe it with a few exceptions of Agla Bendikaita and Ausiala Pozjarskaita, but the overall picture is that we don't really have um, that in, uh, internal history presented. So, yes, I agree that we need to collaborate and there are a number of examples of successful uh, collaborations. Different institutions had various projects. Uh, the History Institute had cooperated with the Vilna Go On Museum in the past, some 20 years ago. We uh, were preparing an exhibition and a catalog. Uh, Inter-institutional cooperation between all the institutions for Jewish studies, I think we, there's no need to uh, reinvent the bike here. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to move forward because time is really pressing us and uh, there are so many questions that I want to discuss. Vigant, as you mentioned, uh, uh, a very interesting case of Plunge Museum, Re regional museums. These are very interesting things, and uh, um, I'm following these things as well. Clip at the university, uh, how do you cooperate? What are connections have you developed, and what are the possibilities of other connections? Yes, of course, and uh, the connections, we develop connections through our alumni uh, who start working in various uh, culture centers, museums, and uh, who start their activity. And this activity uh, is related to, uh, to telling, let's say, the history of a certain uh, like when you talk about the history of a certain town or shtetle, the brand will be the history of, is it going to be Jews. For example, if you talk about Darbene, if you talk about Rusne, you 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 you, you talk about let's say uh, a local uh, log. Um, merchant who was a friend of Mahatma Gandhi. So it, it, it becomes like a brand of uh, talking about uh, the local Jewish history of Shtetle. So these connections, we make these connections through our uh, alumni who work in various uh, museums and, and centers. Some examples. Uh, the book, for example, was published about Shvekshna Jews. And this book was published by one of our alumni in the Pl Plonge Museum. Uh, the conference was really successful that they organized. Uh, 
Yet another conference was organized by Palanga Museum. And this year, at Tel Shei Museum also organized a conference uh, 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 where Bendikate and Dr. Bendikate, Pajarete, Lara were, were uh, participants. And Clape at the university contributes in a way that these final texts get a scientific f uh, uh, finalization. Uh, not a lot of presentations are scientific, of a scientific con content. Mostly they speak g in general about the history of, of, of uh, towns. So uh, during the process of editing, um, we, or during other processes of support, so uh, we help contribute to these publications. So the, the publication is really pleasant to read. Uh, when it comes to education, uh, well, yes, Vilna, when we talk about Vilnius, yes, we have the tradition, the Vilna Gaon, the, the, the great synagogue, uh, but sometimes we f forget other traditions, for example, Telshi Yeshiva, which was unique. Uh, and the memory of Telshi Jews and Telshi Yeshiva uh, uh, is something um, other li little towns in Lithuania could could envy. Vigante, how about Derbeni? Derbeni town uh, that they have uh, was researched by every. Um, he has been visiting Derbeni for a long time. He has collected a lot of material. How do you cooperate on an international level? The, yes, I know what you're talking about, but I don't have this context. Uh, well, um, remembrance of, uh, of certain personalities also took place with the help of our university. And uh, the ex-ambassador of Israel uh, visited Um, visited us and, uh, uh, for example, with the help of Ambassador, the, 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 the plaque was uh, mm, was uh, uh, erected and uh, to Wolfson. And Wolfson is like Kudirka for, for, for Lithuanians. Um, I know which scientists you're talking about, but we don't specifically work with them right now. Uh, well, uh, I divided the time uh, in, in several parts. The first part was the uh, development of uh, narrative, and in the second part, I would like to talk about education, about reception. In the previous panel, they have also talked about that. So my question would be, in the, do you think Lithuanian Jewish history is uh, uh, interwoven into the Lithuanian history narrative to a, to a large extent, and uh, in terms of education, and what do you think? What aspects need to be corrected immediately? Which aspects need attention immediately? Lara, that's the question for you. Violeta, thank you very much for the question. Uh, that that was my purpose. And uh, three years ago, I left academia. And so when three years ago in Judaica, uh, Jewish Studies Center was uh, uh, established in the, Vil in the National Library, I decided to join it. And, and uh, my task, uh, or, which I carry out, and also of my colleagues, is to be a mediator be between the quality uh, studies, academic studies, and society, uh, which, uh, I'm sorry, this is an, uh, Nico, which, uh, so the information uh, to society often is uh, rendered in apologetic uh, um, formats, in, in formats of low quality. And I see uh, that our main task is to select, to make a selection, and and voluntary educational policy policy uh, should be focused in that.
And in fact, uh, I think this eco is really in in a, in a way. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe. Ah, okay. I uh, just got a technical explanation why I got this eco. So, briefly, uh, talking, I can say that I can. This reception is not. Well, there's a huge disbalance between quality studies and to what extent it is known, and to what it is known, to what extent this is known to society. I don't know whether this gap uh, can be filled. At all, it's natural that academic uh, groups, uh, that the level of knowledge and the uh, reception of knowledge between academia and the society is going to be not the same. But I think that uh, uh, the, an another important task is the issue of sensitivity. And uh, I sensitivity, I mean, it's, it's not a natural thing, a sensitivity to what and how is discussed about the Jewish history, what is appropriation, what is knowledge. These things can be developed. These things can be educated. They do not come naturally. And it, this is something uh, that we should educate and develop, and this is what we are trying to do. Thank you very much. Do other, do other participants of the panel have any comments? Jurgita. Jurgita and Vigantas. Oh, Vigantas and Jurgita. Well, uh, Vigantas, uh, Jewish history is very interesting. It's different. It can be attractive if uh, it's told attractively. We're talking about Jewish traditions. So we're talking about different way of life. M let's say mitzvah, bar mitzvah norms, the, the Jewish festivals. Uh, if they are told uh, in, in a in deep in, in a detailed and interesting way to uh, people, they're going to be interesting. Maybe we should not focus and emphasize horrible things that everybody is is uh, tired of. Maybe uh, we 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 have to talk about that first, uh, and the narrative has to be interesting and attractive, and not only academically dry, so to say. Jurgita. Um, a small comment to what Lara has said. Inevitably, uh, uh, we have to see society when you see certain groups. And age group uh, is uh, a moment that helps us to understand how the society reflects on these issues. And here I can see a danger, or maybe a, an area which is the most sensitive, uh, the age group which is the most sensitive, pupils, students who are in the limits of a certain uh, educational system and the certain curriculum, they get certain information. And here we have a uh, um, quite a big disbalance. And in the, currently, the history curricula are being changed. And uh, uh, we will see more proportions, um, less disbalance, and the Jewish history will be more integrated into the school uh, history cur curriculum. In the university, uh, um, I'm very happy that uh, uh, Jewish history is taught not only in the courses specifically dedicated to the Jewish history, but also to general, uh, in general courses. And, but where I see a problem is that how people, um, where, where people get knowledge who are not in educational uh, system, outside of educational system, when they leave educational system, to what extent they are ready to dedicate time for these topics. Because at school and university, yes, at, at this point, we can regulate education. We can make influence at some point. But when, we, when it comes to lifelong learning, uh, people some, sometimes si simply have no alternative. Thank you very much. Darius, would you like to comment on that? Well, uh, my colleagues know these things better. I just wanted to answer your previous question. Do you know Eric Wolfstein? Uh, 
Wolf Stein. Um, the, uh, in the last conference, so, so we really know this personality. It has been discussed in various conferences. We have discussed uh, about this personality. We have reactions already. We have some comments and questions. Um, I'll ask one more question. I, I'll skip some of the questions that I have prepared, and we will uh, dedicate several minutes to answer the questions in uh, in the chat. Uh, dissemination. The history of Holocaust uh, was discussed, uh, we, we discussed it, and this is the topic that society is interested most. But we have also uh, seen in 2016 and, and later on that there is a miscommunication between researchers, between society, and uh, uh, when preparing for this uh, conference, I remembered uh, the book by Ruta Vanagaita and Christoph Dickmann, the study about Holocaust in Lithuania, as far as I know, is being translated into English and into Lithuanian. Uh, and the main goal of this project is education, as the project developers say. Uh, in Lithuania, or let's say... Uh, well, they, they say that everything has been written about the Holocaust. Maybe it's... Um, it's exaggeration, but nothing has been read. So professional narrative creators, do you think uh, they participate in the society education to uh, an, an enough, uh, enough? Uh, or maybe uh, they are pressed uh, to uh, become preoccupied with history politics, uh, to get involved in political discussions. What do you think? Darius, what do you think about that? Well, I would start to this uh, issue of ex 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 exaggeration. As e historians, we shouldn't think that uh, something is already written, even on the topics that we write themselves. I believe that uh, very soon we will have a, a, a new text about Holocaust in Lithuania. Solus Sujedelis. Uh, is 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 uh, preparing his book, and I hope that next year. Uh, this book will be published in an academic uh, publishing house in America, and uh, there are plans to translate it into Lithuanian. Speaking of Holocaust, there are a lot of topics uh, to be researched, especially um, when trying to incorporate the Holocaust uh, to the context of violence against Jews in previous centuries. Now, in an attempt to answer the question whether historians uh, participate in the discourse uh, of society, um, do, whether they participate uh, enough, I think the, the issues that are related to the world outlook, mentality, do not change very quickly. And to expect that we will be able to quickly uh, to, to transfer academic achievements to the awareness of society is, is naive. And uh, I th Joachim Tauber, in one of his books, uh, have uh, written a, an article about how much time uh, Germany needed to uh, m to understand what happened during World War II. In Lithuania, these processes are slow. And whether this participation of historians is enough, I don't know. I admit that I don't know. Thank you very much. Jurgita, would you also like to reflect on that? Well, I understand I, 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 uh, uh, what has been said and what uh, society expects uh, from researchers and academics and what we actually do uh, in our job is not always related to the most relevant issues. For example, the Holocaust. In, 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 on the international level, it has been admitted that this topic has been exhausted and not academically um, new. Uh, new facts will not change the awareness. 
Um, so scientists uh, do fundamental research, and we uh, work on the topics which are not of a necessary awareness to society, so to say, or this uh, awareness comes to society after some time. And uh, we work in a very like small circle of people, and then only when, then afterwards, knowledge is created, which can be uh, introduced in a larger context. So I think that the academic environment uh, actually uh, appears uh, increasingly frequently in the public discourse, not only uh, um, when it comes to Holocaust. There are a lot of public projects related to, uh, to, to various things, let's say um, popular things or what has been published in media. Uh, the, for example, what has been happening this year, these are very popular texts that are based on research, on studies. So sometimes the research is masked and it's uh, it's not always visible. Like you, you get two pages of a text in, in a media, in, in a mass media, and you can't always notice, You can't, people do not always know that this is based on research. So science is, uh, is stepping ahead uh, faster than what is presented in, in, in the society. Okay, very briefly, Vigantas, what do you think? Do you think scientists need to participate in discussions, in, in, in discussions organized by media, like mass media? What do you think? Well, I really think that scientists have to participate in the discussions organized by media, not only on the topics of ho the Holocaust and, and, and Jews. Uh, if, uh, sometimes Daily Telegraph, rate, uh, media outlets, uh, um, if, we, we, we can see that the professors of universities, they discuss on various topics, starting from ecology uh, to humanitarian uh, uh, things or refugee issues, and they provide their insights, uh, visions based on rational science. Of course, scientists have to participate, because otherwise uh, we're going to get various, uh, we're going to be only seeing various ideas, let's say, on the topic of the Holocaust, uh, which will be clearly anti-Semitic. On the other hand, this issue is so complex that it is impossible to answer in several several minutes. Uh, the history, policy, and uh, academic research, I mean, that probably needs another workshop online. We have only several minutes, and I will read a comment. Uh, uh, the Lit uh, uh, Lithuanian Jewish history is too much centered, Vilnius-centered. That was a comment, uh, one, one of the comments of the listeners. Uh, so how about textbooks? Uh, how are you going, uh, how are you doing with the reforming of textbooks? Maybe Lara? No. Well, I think uh, Yurgita is more related to that. Yurgita. Well, actually, Akvila in the first panel is much more connected. So, <laughs> Yurgita, maybe you'll be representing yourself. And Akvila. Since uh, curricula are being changed at the moment, and uh, after this one, the textbooks will be rewritten. So we are in an intermediary situation where a curricula will be approved, and history is not the only discipline whose uh, curricula are being changed. And uh, we're in, like working on the consensus right now, and I, I heard very positive news from, from not Akvila, but from other people who work directly uh, from educational centers, there's a thing that I've been dreaming of. That is an integration in in, 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 integra in integrative way. For example, biography of Einstein. Why could it not be uh, presented in the f in, in the subject of physics? Or uh, you don't even need the uh, history class for that. You just have to be creative. And we have been talking about these uh, things. And uh, 
and uh, I hope that we're going to have, uh, we're going to see this breakthrough. And uh, I think I'm, I'm very positive about that. For that, is the glasses are half empty and half full, and uh, I would see this situation as half full. <laughs> thank you very much. We're only one minute behind the schedule, not too bad. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all the panelists for their ideas, for the discussion. I would like to wish you a lot of success in your studies, in your research in uh, creating this uh, image or mosaic or narrative and I will be looking forward to meeting you in the future in this format at least which I quite like thank you very much thank you Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will continue debating on the Jewish, modern Jewish history and the research of Jewish history. And we will start now a debate on uh, discussing complicated issues related to Jewish uh, history in Lithuanian uh, culture. So I will soon introduce uh, the panelists and I will only emphasize uh, certain uh, features of their biography, what I, as a moderator, see important. So first of all, uh, a, uh, Ina Pukelite, a, uh, she teaches at uh, the um, Vitoras Magnus University. She's the playwright. Uh, and uh, last year, a novel, uh, um, Misses from um, uh, Lice with, uh, uh, Avenue. Uh, the book was released just last year. I would also like to introduce the director of Ilnagon Museum of Jewish History, Marka Zingeris, who is also a poet, a playwright. I have read a number of your books, but today I will try to ask you about the one which impressed me most. I was sitting on Stalin's lap and I had the honor to present this novel in one of the bookshops shops of Konas. I think that is a, a novel because it is quite lengthy. I will also have certain question, questions to you today. I would also like to present uh, uh, the poet, prosaist, and playwright Sigitas Parulskis. Sigitas, me as a historian, I think Sigitas has done a lot in a lot in enriching uh, uh, our uh, cultural history by writing his books, uh, especially the novel uh, Murmuring Walls, and another novel that he wrote, uh, Darkness and Partners. So these two novels uh, are really favored by historians and history students in, in the history faculty and they really analyze them with caution. And historians really admire and enjoy films by uh, 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 Raimondas Banyonis. The recent one uh, is uh, Purple um, Fog. So uh, he's a film director. And I would like to encourage all the participants, all the uh, observers of the debate to ask questions. And we will try to answer them if, if, if we have enough time. I am, um, well, I have a plan of a discussion of a debate. We try to uh, negotiate it with, with the panelists, and I see this debate uh, made of two parts. In the first part, I will ask each and every one of you about certain uh, uh, pieces of art uh, uh, that may relate to our today's topic. So my introduction question is uh, one and the same question to all of you. Uh, and uh, this question emerged uh, from the words I've read in, in Sikita Sparulski's novel. It is strange that we think of the past that is something behind us, behind our back. It is here in my head, a few centimeters from my eyes, which are watching uh, letters appearing in, on uh, the screen. I truly 
agree uh, with what has been said with these final ideas. And, you know, uh, people of the 20th century uh, uh, understand themselves, realize themselves in a... In a awkward manner, you know, we have to understand this history uh, through our thoughts, which cannot be uh, closed somewhere. So we have to pay due attention to the Jewish history, which we are trying to tame and, and to see as an integral part of our uh, Lithuanian history. And this multivocalism of the past is observed not only by historians, but also by the uh, uh, film directors, by uh, artists and theater critics. I'm not a literature cri literary critic, but I think that the literature of 20th century uh, had to face a similar phenomenon phenomena like the literature of the UK in in 1970s 1960s had to to go with when the most prominent cultural figures start working and interpreting on the uh, most famous uh, pieces on the most famous novels and books. So why do you think uh, the elite of the arts started negotiating those very painful uh, topics of our past? Uh, whether those pains are so relevant that they can simply be left behind and can be left for historians alone to deal with them. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, I will improvise a little. As a child, I remember exploding uh, uh, the frozen surface of River Namunas. Uh, you know, uh, when the f f uh, uh, the ice would freeze, uh, they would expl uh, explode uh, this ice in, in order to allow uh, the natural flow of the river. So this is how I feel uh, now. We are busting the stereotypes. We are uh, exploding this ice that has been on the surface of, of our memories. The narrative that I heard at my school, at my secondary school, and that secondary school was the same school uh, which was attended by President Adamkus in, uh, in front of, of the central post office uh, in Kaunas. So this lie and those voices of our family, they were so different from what I've been taught at school. I could not... I, I, you know, I could not be this double-faced person. I could only believe one truth. The speaker is singing a old song. The Jewish Scout song. So these songs, my father would, was singing as he was shaving uh, himself in the morning. And that is a multi-vocal, multilateral uh, story. Let's not dig it six meters deep, you know, but let us remember it. Let us adopt and let us uh, embrace uh, this history. And only this is how we can build a new uh, history. We need to get rid of this claustrophobia. Maybe I'm talking for too long because this question was addressed to everyone, but, you know... This is uh, how I see the situation. It's uh, busting all the myths and having this uh, uh, multivocal uh, history and narrative. Would anyone else like to uh, respond to this question? Why cannot? W why we should not leave the historical past to historians alone? Well, I would briefly add to what Marcus has said. You, to, you spoke about exploding the ice. Yes, there were many things covered and unspoken of. There were many things that we did not know of. And Odemas asks why it's about 21st century. Artists 
after the Sayadis reform movement. Well, the Kanovich novel uh, was released in 1926, and there were many questions why Lithuanians are not doing anything and uh, why they are not talking. There was a great uh, uh, flow of, of, of uh, memories, autobiographies uh, of, of those deported to Siberia, and the Jewish to uh, topics were not... Uh, touched upon, uh, they were not surfacing somehow. But uh, in the beginning of 21st century, well, I could talk of me personally, we had so much uh, information and so many sources uh, that we, you know, could not filter it. There was a I think it was the period uh, uh, of the end of the 20th century when we focused on, on, on uh, various publications. Now, we started to forget about uh, that uh, information and now new pieces of art started emerging. We started writing new uh, novels and uh, we are kind of detoxifying ourselves. Thank you, Sigitas. I think this is high time to take your book, Darkness and Partners, and I will ask immediately you a question uh, about this novel, but I will first quote one sentence, which says by Jacob Senior to Vincent, the quote, people like fairy tales, people like listening to stories, but history never listens to uh, people. So this is the answer why we haven't been talking about certain issues for a while or we try to postpone talking or addressing certain issues. As a historian, I know that certain topics are more difficult to analyze in emotional uh, way. So your novel about darkness and partners is, is, is a novel about a person who likes uh, storytelling. It is already a cultural phenomena. There were no indifferent people. Some really admired it, some really criticized it. So I would like to talk about your um, creational intentions and certain decisions, certain solutions that you uh, uh, used for this uh, novel. What do you think, uh, how should we talk about the, the manifestations of evil and why by describing those uh, perpetrators, uh, you portrayed them as, as biblical figures and why the main uh, character of the book is a photographer. that there was something wrong with, with this topic, with the uh, Jewish topic in Lithuania. I have realized this uh, f uh, from the very beginning uh, when I started writing the book. Uh, last week I spoke to the Poles. Uh, we had a, 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 a remote debate uh, in Olsztyn. Uh, they released my book, The Darkness and Partners. Uh, so they asked me why I had this idea of writing uh, this novel. Let's say if I would have uh, written an adventure novel, nobody would ask me, you know, a writer wrote a book. But when you ask a, a book on this topic, everyone wants to ask why you did so. And in Lithuania, I faced this question a number of times. And I can tell you why I came up with this idea of writing uh, on the topic. I started to analyze why I'm an, an anti-Semite or anti I have anti-Semitic views, because anti-Semitic tradition in Lithuania, I think it's not necessarily vulgar or ag aggressive or very radical. It's simply uh, the, the so-called household um, anti-Semitism that still exists quietly uh, in Lithuania as some kind of virus. I like the idea by German uh, philosopher uh, Peter van Dyck 
about uh, this self-consciousness uh, that our internal eye has two stages of self-perception. That is the naive level, when you think that all the programming, all the education, bringing up and dressage, whatever it, it may be, political, moral, or, or that it is all mine, that is my opinion, I am what I am, this is how I think, this is how I feel, this is uh, uh, what my taste is like. The second uh, stage, the second level is the reflective stage. Uh, is, you know, this is a research, this is something that I have been taught, this is not something that is that was not given, that is not mine, and that I have taken over this from the from this environment, from my from the traditions, from my parents. So thinking of antisemitism, I felt this natural resistance inside of me, and I tried to uh, look for reasons why I felt this inner resistance. Then you dig deeper to this naive self-perception, and you realize that people don't really... Um, they unconsciously do things. They repeat someone else's positions, something they have heard. So the main thing is to start thinking, to start analyzing why you're doing... Uh, Something why you have certain opinions, uh, why you strongly fight for those opinions and for your truths. So this is what caused this willingness to write such a book. In terms of religious aspects, Bowles, uh, well, had something to tell me. You know, they really prefer and um, they really love um, cat. Catholicism, so they said that they, I used too many uh, religious images in the book. But my old dream was writing some apocalyptic story. In the past, I loved to read those apocalyptic Bibles. Uh, there are a number of those books written in the world. I only know four of those uh, ca uh, canonic uh, books. So I'm not re really sure of how you need to write about evil, or how you need to write about certain topics. I think writers and artists themselves, no, no matter what, uh, what area of art they represent, they choose the forms and, and of expression and the way they want to speak about certain uh, topics. This is a very sensitive material, in my view, and it is truly atrocious. When you start writing on the topic, you encounter that naive level of self-perception. And all the cliches start emerging. I remember at Mark's museum, we were presenting the book, and I still said that this, I still feel this anti-Semitism inside of me, and it is not easy uh, to get rid of it, because it, it feels rather convenient, you know? Mm. Uh, those... Uh, Those attitudes, you know, uh, feel really convenient to, to simply take them and use them. But, but resisting them is not easy, even for yourself. It makes you feel uncomfortable if you start fighting those uh, uh, attitudes. And, and people stick to certain views, not because they really think so, just because it is more convenient. I'm sorry for taking too uh, long. Thank you, Sigitas. Uh, the most important thing is that you said, uh, you have said uh, things that let us move us uh, forward. And uh, there are no recipes to things that you have said about, for example, how to write about evil. Another thing is uh, that we often choose what is uh, convenient. Us. And uh, uh, there are certain 
uh, certain patterns of thinking are very convenient for us. And uh, the texts of writers are more in influential than those of scientists because they make us step out of our usual patterns of thinking. And uh, I have a question to Mark about his method, about his attitude, about his ability to talk about history, about horrible history, uh, in a very light way. I, I will quote f uh, from your novel. It's very um, a weird thing, and I quote, it's very weird thing the way we inherit history through various things. And in spite of what is inherited for us, we are able to reborn and to live on further on in a world. So you are like a, end of quote, you are a, like a um, historian who says that you have to tame uh, the past to To, to be able to live uh, further on. Let's talk about your method, about your cu cultural uh, intentions. Uh, in your uh, in your interview with uh, Ramona Zgerbotavich, you said that you are aiming two things, and I'm going to focus on one, how history plays with the destiny of a person with a, without him knowing about that. Well, I've been always interested in that, and it's not the problems uh, problems of the 20th century. It's an eternal problem. A person on the street, an ordinary person in the street, that uh, that let's say a house that he passes by, uh, in that house there are people who are deciding on his destiny. And the decision made by people he doesn't even know will make him suffer, will influence his life so much. I call it superior powers. Um, I, I took over this term from Pasternak. That happens all the time. But in the 20th century, that happened in a very concentrated manner together with the development of uh, technology this this hell the stepping out of hu humanity occurred and and that you know makes you feel paranoid that your destiny is being decided by superior powers. I was interested in to what extent the person is dependent on circumstances and to what extent a person is able to liberate himself or herself from circumstances. I've always been interested in... Well, I have... I have found it as a, as a cigarette, but I have found... This uh, this this rule uh, or canon uh, as a as an author uh, introduces a supposedly allegedly di discovered uh, manuscript. So uh, by telling a bo by writing a book by telling a story, you uh, become a character, and sometimes you step aside, and you are an observer. So I made the separation between characters and uh, a narrator, the narrator. The narrator is also very authentic, and uh, there are a lot of pe details from my personal life in it, in, in the narrator's voice. The purpose, uh, one of the purposes of the books was to challenge uh, anti-Semitic narratives. The book is about uh, a little boy uh, who, uh, by winning a competition, gets an opportunity to sit on the lap of uh, of the great leader. So, so the, the, the beginning, the story starts when where the author introduces a manuscript and. This manuscript is left by, let's say, a, a widower, and that's one of the parts of the composition. 
Um, many voices, actually, that's another uh, aspect. And I... The, the language of the uh, Soviet theater, Soviet uh, cinema was very uh, artificial. That was a, one of the communicational catastrophes. It was very artificial. It was uh, not natural. It was not authentic language. Authentic language is completely different. Well, of course, you have to have a taste, intuition. This is like using salt, not too much, not too little. There are Russian phrases, German phrases. As in uh, another novel which I'm working on currently, So I understood that my reader, he's not going, he's not going to my old, my alter ego. It's not another me. Our society is so diverse that something that is um, something that I take for granted is not going to be the same for other members of society. That's why I had to make a lot of footnotes, but that's also a canon. Literature is very old. Let's say Cervantes uh, used so many footnotes. So, so I use a lot of footnotes for, uh, in the dialogues, in the narrative, and the, the, the narrator's uh, in the narrator's voice and the publishing house also uh, made a footnote which is a very dry and encyclopedic uh, but it's also part of the narrative and it uh, and it develops it it, it com composes a character it contributes to the to, to com composing uh, character so um, the ending of the book, for me, it has to be unexpected and not uh, influenced by the external circumstances, but by internal voice. Uh, usually something very in intuitive, and I was surprised myself that my character has to get drowned in the Baltic Sea. But then I remembered that my mother... Uh, my mother was in a, in 1944, he was in a big ship, uh, military ship in the Baltic Sea that was like, a, it was turned into prison. And only, and, and it actually, it was bombarded and it sank and only a few, a few, a few uh, passengers managed to survive. So, I don't know, maybe uh, this is uh, my pessimistic approach to the future. Uh, my character had to drown. I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether I had to show some torturing and and things like that. Uh, and at, at that time, the real nation of Lithuania was born, uh, not uh, f featured by uh, some some very like national reality. So my character had to to drown, and I don't know why. And that finished my. Line, the, the line of narrative, and and this composition of my novel was very intuitive, and also a global. I like playing with the, like global topics: Kremlin, Washington, Berlin, and local, like a small person, and big global context. So I like these contrasts. Thank you, Marcus, very much. It's very important for me what you said at the end of, of, of your contribution, that you were looking uh, for ways of how to relate the lives of small people to uh, the, the, the plays of, um, of the games of uh, great history, great context. And by telling a story of a family, you managed to tell the, the history of the 20th century. Uh, when I took 
the book of Ina Pokelite, uh, Girls from uh, Lice West Avenue, and I understood, I understood that this novel gave me an opportunity to, um, to become uh, introduced once again to Kona City. And um, uh, the book cover says, and, and I quote, this book is dedicated to the generation of my grandparents who uh, could not tell their stories to their grandchildren because of historical events. This uh, story aims at helping people understand uh, the history of Konas during the interwar period. Uh, and what's interesting for me that in, in the Lithuanian historiography, um, women's voice is, is, is really very scarce, uh, even though we are talking about the many voices of the past. It, whereas in your novel, you uh, uh, speak about two women, you divide the book into Polish and Jewish. Again, my question is about the method. How did you discover these two women? How did you decide that you, the, the book needs to be divided into two parts? Why one, is, uh, why, why one part is very light and the other one is very difficult to read, very complex? Well, the Jewish topic, uh, the, the, the Jewish book, I decided to write the book because of my uh, studies. I studied the Jewish theater. Uh, I'm a theater researcher, and uh, in, in our uh, minds, uh, Jews are perceived, in a, as Sigita said, in, a, in an anti-Semitic way. Lithuanians understand, perceive Jews as a mythical evil and uh, the generations that we have nowadays uh, really avoid talking about uh, about this that and uh, one of my grandmothers is uh, Samogitian and uh, the other uh, grandmother uh, was born in Leopoya but she grew up in Kaunas and uh, she only talked Polish uh, with me and uh, my relatives. So after a long time, it was interesting for me to uh, investigate why this la Polish language was so important in Kaunas uh, when Kaunas was the, uh, the then capital of Lithuania and the Lithuanian culture, the Lithuanian uh, narrative was the main one. And my knowledge of theater studies, uh, my, my theater studies uh, um, really uh, focus on interwar uh, theater creators such as Dogovietis or Valis Ruaga or uh, many other actors that were prominent during the interwar period. I, 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 I saw this uh, the theater people uh, the gentry as very Lithuanian-like, and actually my research showed that Konas was very different. I live myself in Konas, in Jalakalnis, and uh, I go for uh, go to the city of K uh, center every day, and uh, all of a sudden I saw Konas in a different per period of time, and I saw it through the eyes uh, of someone who lives in the 19... 30s and these invisible people invisible characters opened up to me uh, we m mustn't forget that in the in 1930s there were 27 percent of uh, of people were jews uh street and ukmerges street and the old town these were the locations inhabited greatly by the Jews. Uh, almost uh, a third of population of Konas were was was Jewish, which all of a sudden disappeared. So this gap between Konas that I know now and Konas that was before the war uh, was very uh, important for me emotionally, and and I wanted to. Um, through, this, not through the knowledge of this gap, I wanted to reveal interwar conus to the modern readers and to reveal it without cliches of Lithuanianness. 
uh, by showing multi multicultural uh, Konas. Marcus, for example, knows uh, the Jewish culture from inside, and for me, the Jewish culture uh, revealed itself th from the outside. And the character of Ra 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 Rachel, Raquel, um, um, was developed by, for, for, by me reading a lot of texts. Uh, and uh, whereas uh, the character of a Polish girl was a bit easier for me to construct because I remember the environment where my grandmother uh, lives and it was uh, she, she lived in Shanxi uh, district and it was very authentic so it was a bit easier for me to construct the Polish character so through this spiral narrative I wanted to show that we have very different approaches to the same object, to the same um, city, Konas, for instance, and these different approaches, different views are very important. There, might, there can't be one approach to one object, a city. They have to be multilateral, and all these uh, uh, approaches uh, make up the, the whole picture, what we are now. And in my novel, the, the bigger part of the novel is dedicated to the interwar period and the more optimistic outlook on the world. These women are young, they're young ladies, and uh, in my novel, I, I dedicate several parts to, to war, to the uh, occupation of Soviet Soviets and uh, and then uh, my, my novel ends in 1941, uh, October, when the Nazis come. So uh, with, with the coming of Nazis, uh, my novel ends uh, before, just so, so I finished the novel just before all the horrible things that happened. Of course, maybe I could have gone further on and maybe I could develop on the topic of war and, and talk about what happened during the Holocaust. But Aurumas, as you said, it's a very painful topic and it's very difficult to enter this topic and you don't want to spend a lot of time in this topic. Uh, on the internet, we see uh, we see a lot of things, and that this is uh, why we live in uh, this horizontal uh, world. Mm. And thanks to technology, so we see so much iconographical items that we couldn't have seen before. Mm. Mm, just because we couldn't, for example, uh, previously travel to, let's say, Washington Holocaust Museum, and now all this material, iconographic material, is open to you uh, through the help of technologies. So, so these uh, iconographic uh, motives are very important. I wanted to um, develop my characters in this humane world and, and, and to save them, so to say. Uh, Ina, thank you very much. Uh, yes, so we sometimes intuitively avoid uh, discussions and topics that are emotionally painful to us. And I'm looking now at Raim on this, uh, Bagnonis. Your movie, uh, The uh, Purple Fog, it speaks about war, it speaks about people who, uh, uh, during the World War II, after World War II, which do not find peace. Their internal dem demons uh, continue uh, torturing them. The script uh, of uh, your uh, movie that was written by Irena Tashirelite uh, is based on Felix Rosner's no uh, short story that can be found on the internet. Why did you decide to work with this uh, text? Because the, the uh, there was a lot of discussion when this movie uh, was uh, uh, was launched, and I know there were two scripts, uh, Ivashkavichus and Cherelite scripts, uh, based on the same short story, and you decided to work with Cherelite's script. So why did you choose uh, this way, and uh, what things were important to you to emphasize with the language of cinema when talking about war and horror that uh, we experience after war. Well, talking about that there are new texts, new novels, uh, well, I have to say, um, I, well, I worked with the director Militinius who said, uh, don't look for new things uh, or look for the old things. 
for me, this short story uh, was wo well known. And well, we as artists, but well, maybe formally I can say like I'm an artist, we often uh, think that it's important what we say, what we speak, what we express, express. And I, th but I think that is Im is that what what is important is how uh, what you say uh, makes an influence on uh, on people you talk to, whether your language stirs something in, in, in people. I think that's important. Because, yes, formally I can, you know, um, uh, yes, I made a movie, uh, critics said this and that, but if if uh, that, that stirs something in a person, in a viewer, uh, that's the value, and only then a person can understand, perceive something in in his life, only when it touches him or her. I grew up, uh, well, as a teenager, we were a, a group of four friends. One of them was Ruben Wein, he of a Jewish origin. And for us, it wasn't important at the time at all. So we were friends, there was a four, four of us, four friends, and we grew up. Uh, we experienced a lot of adventures, and only then, well, that was Soviet times, and only then, uh, different different times came. Uh, we started receiving a lot of information, knowledge, and then Konovich uh, was what fam well, for me famous at the time, but not that famous. So Konovich, Konovich's novel, novel uh, and works were written, and then I understood that Jews are. They were a big part, a significant part of Lithuania since uh, the times of the uh, Grand Duke Vitotas. And I all of a sudden understood that we don't know anything about that. We haven't talked about that. We haven't discussed that. And I started thinking, why? Well, why is that? Why is that so? And I understood that the Jewish community was quite a close community, and that's why. Uh, that might might have been the reason for myths and 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 um, or superstitions. I don't know how you, how you refer to them. And that the culture is so much connected to the Lithuanian culture in terms of religion, for example. And so I, I I understood that it's interesting to me. And a lot of my friends are Jews, and and they my. My friends, not because they are Jews, but this is because they are part of me, uh, part of my culture, part of my mentality. And this story uh, that we're talking about uh, is uh, interesting because uh, the character is one of us. He's one of people. He's not a separate uh, from from from. The rest of society. You know, I work in Riga a lot, and I understood this uh, issue. Half of Riga is Russians, half of Riga is Latvians. And the biggest problem is that they communicate very little in terms of culture. Well, the Russians watch one TV channel, Latvians watch another one. And I see uh, that it's not going to be any good. There's going to be something, uh, uh, something bad. It's going to explode at some point. And I think that, well, so um, I made a movie uh, in 1972 uh, about how Jews uh, go leaped for Israel. And I now have a, I know a person who comes back, who's coming back right now. He left Lithuania uh, for Israel in 1972, and now he's coming back. Unfortunately, COVID has closed the walls, but uh, I, th I think we sort of some supplement each other. The cultures supplement each other. He's coming back with his wife and three daughters, and I think we become richer and uh, not being close, I think, would help us move on. Because I think if you are too close, uh, it may um, end up with uh, so many bad things. And, and of course, the Holocaust. There are a lot of powerful movies and 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 books, but there are other topics that you want to talk about. I I I want that people would think, you know, would stop and think uh, uh, after reading a book or after watching a movie uh, to think about their stereotypes. 
maybe as Sigita said, my anti-Semitism, maybe that was also one of the you know causes. I think only by being open, by communicating uh, in, in the format like this, like this conference, can can uh, move things forward. And I think it's high time we did this. That would be it. Thank you, Raimundas. I see how much we have planned to discuss and how little time we have for our debate. In some five minutes, we should conclude our speech, uh, uh, our debate, and to start the next session. So, in response to what Raimundas said, I would like to ask the very final question. Not impo it is not important what we do, but it is important how our creation lives, uh, dwells on when we release it, you know, uh, what uh, uh, reactions it, it, it uh, promotes. You all try to tell uh, your stories uh, to uh, testify certain truths of history and uh, by allowing the past to speak we would not definitely hear what we like so what were the most interesting what were the most unexpected reactions that you received after your books you published after your films were released could you share it Sigita said that he had a lot of criticism. He received a lot of criticism. Well, many people asked, did I really sit on Salin's lap? That was the most original uh, question I got. Well, what, un what was unexpected, that my book was translated into Russian, and I uh, did not really know how would they see uh, this book, how would they receive this book. I know that they would know Stalin, but you know, but with that reality, how I depicted him would be acceptable for them. When we talk about Jews, we only talk about war, occupation, interwar period, and that's it. But, you know, during the Soviet eras, we had many painful di dilemmas. Uh, I, know, I knew a doctor uh, of the Red Cross Hospital who was uh, dropped out from the Communist Party, and all the Lithuanians unanimously voted in favor of dropping him out of the party. It was 1980. Uh, the security service uh, was taking photographs. In the evening, uh, the same people who voted in favor of dropping him out from the, his party were standing next to his uh, next to the door of his apartment with flowers uh, saying him farewell uh, as he left for Israel so in terms of unexpected reactions i got a letter from ireland saying that your style reminds me of Anderson movies. There's a, a, a American uh, writer who uh, wrote a satiric and playful uh, novel. So. In Lithuania, some people said that uh, that my book is worth of novel uh, novel mm, uh, literature prize. I know that those are exaggerated emotional reactions, but some people, you know, very unexpected people like pilots, uh, reacted to my book. And it, in personal. Uh, Mm, conversations, uh, they all received my book very well. It seems that that is not proof that that doesn't really happen in reality. And, you know, and these were not only uh, compliments, I'm, ra I'm rather skeptical and I can tell the truth, the, uh, the difference. Thank you. Ina uh, Raimonda Sigitas, could you just say one sentence in terms of reactions that you receive? 
the most interesting reaction that I got was how many Jews paid me to write this book. I could not tell because they did not pay me a penny. I had nothing to tell them. Raimondas, Ina. Well, what you said, why would you speak about this old thing when we have so many new things to speak about? That was really awkward. Ina, when we speak about the Jewish line in my novel, there were no discussions about it. But when we spoke about the Polish line, many people from Konas uh, were very emotional and they uh, recognized their family members, their ancestors, their grandparents. So there was an, an obvious question of our identity. Are we really who we imagine to be? And there are so many uh, hidden traumas related to our uh, Polish identity. So our debate sh has showed that life is always much more interesting than uh, uh, plans of historians. And we only managed to discuss a very little, uh, very little of those questions that we have planned to discuss. So maybe that is a promise that we will meet again sometime in the future when, when the uh, pandemic releases us from its uh, um, uh, um, quote. Um, Ina, thank you very much uh, for taking part in this debate. Mark, uh, thank you, uh, and thank you, Sigitas and, Ra and Raimondas. I'm grateful to everyone who watched uh, uh, our debate on YouTube. Now is a short break, and we will get back at 2 o'clock, and we'll continue talking about various debates, and we will continue with the a remembrance site of our Jewish heritage. So we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Dear viewers of our discussion, of uh, our discussion and the conference of um, Lithuanian Jewish history, modern directions, uh, we're going now to have a, a panel uh, which is going to be called Creation of Remembrance Places of Lithuanian Jewish History, Good Practices. I am Aurema Shvadas, the moderator of uh, this uh, panel. And let me introduce the participants of the panel. The curator, uh, Dr. Daiva Tsitvarine, uh, the curator of uh, Kaunas 2022, at Mintyes Buras, uh, and uh, the last time we met in the book fair, and uh, this time we meet uh, online, and we're going to be talking about things that we discussed last year. I like also, I would li like to introduce Dr. Zygmas Vitkus uh, from Klaipa, the University Institute of Baltic Region History and Archaeology, and. Uh, I'm very happy that Zygmas is with us because I I would like to mention his dissertation topic, Memoir in Remembrance uh, Politics, the case of Panere, 1944 uh, 2016 So uh, the, uh, the field of his research is much related to the topic of uh, of this panel. Zygmas, hello. Lina, uh, hello, Lina. Lina Shlupovicuti Chernovskaya is an artist, and uh, she is the um, concept author of art project Walls That Remember. And I also say hi to Yulia Turupa. Hello, Yulia. Unfortunately, due to a poor internet connection, we can't see Yulia. But we will be able to hear Yulia's voice. I, w I really wanted to uh, invite Yulia to this panel because uh, she's a screenwriter of uh, the documentary cycle of on the national TV Zahor. Remember, uh, and uh, w one uh, statement uh, to start the, the discussion is that uh, I I got. Uh, the, dis uh, the speakers uh, to this panel to talk about soft, um, Zygmas uses this uh, term, soft uh, 
things, soft uh, aspects, mm. and uh, we are we can't remember like big initiatives like uh, Litvak Garden. We also uh, we we don't have a representative of other. Um, projects as a Shaduva Jewish Memorial, the Lost Shtetl. But uh, I, I was looking for people, uh, for, trying to find people to, for this discussion who, so sort of, sort of solitary dreamers who who develop new initiatives, so who have um, made our cultural life more lively, and uh, that's why I chose this. Uh, perspective of attitude. Another thing that I wanted to say is that I'm, I really invite everyone, all, all uh, viewers, to ask questions, to write their questions. We will react to your questions, of course, and, if, uh, uh, and uh, we will then try to answer your questions. The first question goes to Zygmas. The, uh, the concept of uh, Remembrance place is very popular nowadays, and what is it? What is a remembrance place? How is it created? How they are created? How do they die? Please, Zygma, explain us what we're going to talk about. I actually, yes, one when, when we use such terms, uh, most historians. Uh, uh, probably think about Pierre Gora, uh, Erinnerungsorte, that was the original term in German. According to Mora, these are the places, or historic places and phenomena, uh, which uh, manifest themselves in terms of the collective memory. So these are symbols that crystallize certain ideas and, and emotions. So these are places that are emotionally important to society. And the, 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 these are, may not necessarily be physical uh, places. It can be a personality. Let's say Basanavich or Vilna Gaon can be the remembrance place or, let's say, a fabric, let's say, a flag. Some of these symbols may die as well and these places remembrance places that i've mentioned they are developed uh, in what way they are developed or created um, society uh, from many events of the past chooses certain plots certain places certain personalities that are important for them and establish them through rituals through memorials museums and these places, uh, for example, the register of remembrance places always changes because the memory changes. Some places may become less important than others. Uh, for example, I'm talking like individual uh, graves of ancestors. If the, if the grave is visited, if there are people who remember the deceased, then this place is alive. If uh, there are no people who uh, visit the graves, this place becomes dead. And uh, in the Soviet times, the, there were a lot of remembrance places created uh, that did not mean to society a lot, like Chernikovsky grave or the great uh, war of the nation, uh, of the of fatherland. Uh, yeah, Zygmas, after this uh, theoretical uh, introduction, introduction, can I ask you uh, to... Mm, talk about uh, when, if we can discuss uh, discuss on the topic of the panel. What what are your insights? What are the remembrance places of the Lithuanian Jews, of the Lithuanian uh, Jewish history? And uh, what is the relationship of the twenty first century Lithuanian society with the Lithuanian Jewish history? Uh, of course, I mean our effort to accept the Lithuanian Jewish history as an integral part of the Lithuanian history. Once Lithuania regained the independence in 1990, uh, two fields uh, um, 
became very interesting for research, uh, the Jewish heritage and the Holocaust memory. Uh, the Lithuanian political elite uh, took over these two fields as a part of the Lithuanian, or the general Lithuanian history. And uh, the, the becoming of these two phenomena as a part of the Lithuanian historical mentality is still taking place. So, so cultural heritage and Holocaust, I would, I would think these are two, the, the two main fields. And when talking about remembrance places that I can distinguish, there are several of them. For example, the Lithuanian Jerusalem, the Vilna Gaon, Vilnius Ghetto, and uh, Paneri, um, among others, like Shtetl, uh, Holocaust. Um, but I would, I, I would speak about these ones and, um, and this register of, of, of remembers places is sort of uh, arranged from the top, let's say. S certain remembrance places or some very important initiatives uh, uh, that received a lot of attention, money, and, and so on. And we focus on soft um, aspects, soft places. What do you think about, uh, what do you think about the memorials made of uh, stone and, and, and wood? Well, I would say we have uh, these uh, memorials are the most numerous. And during our independence, there have been a lot of uh, um, projects around the uh, Holocaust, uh, let's say, uh, the, the program of uh, the, the program of Holocaust places, and marking and and and. Um, and then uh, I, I was thinking about what are the predominant uh, uh, signs. And there are three types of signs that are predominant. So these are informational uh, signs, where, what, when. Then another uh, sign, uh, the, the, another area is uh, memorials to Sugihara and and these uh, small uh, signs in Vilnius streets, uh, um, on Vilnius streets, there will be another type of, uh, of, of memorials or sculptures. Zygmas, thank you very much. I'm looking at Daiva, and I would like to ask uh, you about uh, uh, the activity of your program, the Memory Bureau, within the framework uh, of uh, Kaunas uh, 2022. Uh, in the previous panel, I talked with uh, Ina Pukelita uh, with, um, about uh, the multilateral uh, Kaunas, multicultural Kaunas, how your project, the Memory Bureau, helps citizens discover their city. And to see the diversity of uh, of um, remembrance groups, and well, as uh, as the novel of Vina and uh, other artworks, um, plays, or even research articles, TV shows, well, they show that the situation nowadays has changed a lot uh, in comparison to what it was five years ago. There are a lot of initiatives. Uh, that talk about the history, but when we uh, started this project uh, of the European Capital of Culture back in 2015, the Jewish memory was, uh, I would say, a taboo topic, uh, and there were probably no uh, projects on this topic. And uh, the goal of our team on preparing the application of this project, well, the application itself, uh, the format of the application of it, uh, required to talk about the problems of the city. So by considering the DNA or, uh, or the identity of uh, Konas, we have we had to think about the problems that we face. So first of all, uh, we decided to look at the history of uh, the city and the DNA of Konas. And we have to admit that Konas has always been a multicultural, multinational city. 
I always repeat that, but I have to read it again. We want to uh, eliminate the stereotype where people say Konas is the most Lithuanian city of Lithuania. Our goal is to remind everyone that Konas has never been like that. Uh, so the, the, the uh, goal of our program, uh, the Memory Bureau, is to remind everyone of the DNA of Konas as a multinational city and to talk about aspects that we forgot uh, after 1990 when we were too much preoccupied with the writing of our own, of like Lithuanian history. And uh, in our program, we dedicate a lot of attention to the memory of Konas as a multinational city. Another project that I created together uh, with my colleague in, is um, in, inspired by of, of, uh, Tier Nara um, memory remembrance places, and in that project we uh, interview people and uh, we collect manifestations, witnesses of people from of, of different different national backgrounds. Mm, basically, these are the, the these are not uh, the, the, we we refer to them as the uh, stories of Konas residents. We usually do video recordings and uh, we upload them into the website at mintiesvietos.lt or the remembrance place in .lt. So our goal is to uh, fill the educational gap as well as to create uh, to give. Um, inspiration to give material for artists uh, as an inspiration uh, for their artistic projects. And uh, we have a lot of projects right now of artists and I hope that in the future we'll have more of them. Our projects are very site specific. We don't want any stereotypization. Actually, in uh, some projects, uh, which I see in art or culture projects. Our project is related to specific uh, places, specific names, and we want uh, society to remind of these people, to remind of people who lived before us and of their stories. Daiva, you have just um, talked about the, the effort to collect the stories about specific uh, uh, remembrance places about people who lived in certain time and location. Uh, if I interpret it correctly, if I understand it correctly, you do something very similar in the Stories Festival. Can, can you tell us about this initiative? And I really like the, the, the title of the project itself, the Stories Festival. So in what way, to what extent, this uh, complex, dramatic uh, Jewish history of the 20th century was reflected in the Stories Festival? Well, the Stories Festival is a big event of, 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 of our uh, program. Uh, the um, So every program in uh, the capital of culture of Europe has its grand event. So this festival is our great event. And uh, we initiate a lot of, um, a, a lot of events and uh, we want to educate. Our partners also contribute a lot to this festival and telling stories. When we speak about uh, history, when we speak about our grandparents, about Konas residents that lived before us, usually their stories are traumatic stories and it's very important for us to tell them, uh, to, to talk about these stories. And um, a site-specific project such as um, Kalnas Park, uh, Let's, uh, it talks about this specific location, the cemetery of Konas, that was shared by four confessions. We have still a mosque and uh, uh, and a church there. So we so based on these stories, we develop projects and and uh, and we write 
texts about that. The festival of this year was was uh, had a lot of events. It took eight. Uh, it took eight. It was an eight day festival, and we uh, told a lot of stories. The small stories, of the, and big stories of the 20th century and the World War Two, and we talked not only about the Jewish uh, history, but uh, about the all Konas residents. Uh, of course, the. The Jewish population was very big in pre-war Konas. Almost a third of the uh, population of Konas was was Jewish. Uh, was Jewish. So our attention to the Jewish uh, culture is very big. So for me, uh, this experience uh, the, it gave a lot of thoughts about what we have experienced and what people who live before us, what they have experienced. And in the festival, we invited everyone to through through to have a look at the traumas, about the, uh, to the experience of uh, of other uh, people through our own experiences, and to talk about uh, experiences and traumas of other people. So we went to Viljampole, Shachadusha. Uh, Bringing back uh, of names to the collective discourse is very important. Street uh, art projects are very important. Youth uh, talks about war. That's the title of another project. So we have a lot of projects. But what I want to talk about is uh, uh, the street art projects. And it, it had a lot of um, reflections in the world, in Israel. We brought back Lilia. Goldberg, uh, she's very important uh, to Israeli people, and there are pilgrims uh, from Israel who know that she was born in Kona, so they would just try to find and discover the place where she was born, where she lived. So in the place where she lived, this house has not survived, uh, but uh, n close to that house, we created a, a street art project. Another street art project speaks about specific people, a uh, specific story. Um, and the goal of the project is to remind us of, uh, of people who had lives which were discontinued. So that would be it. Daiba, thank you very much. If we have enough time, we will get back to your work in of, of coordination of the office's activities. I think it is now time to ask Lina about her initiative. Sometimes by living in Vilnius, we say that, oh yes, Vilnius is a place where many uh, stories overlap, uh, collide, and Kona still has to discover its history, and we still need to write novels about the about the history of Konas, and Konas has to establish its uh, play, places and sites of remembrance. But uh, Lina's project, Walls Remember, shows very well of how little you see of a self-content dweller of Vilnius, you know, it is a multi-layered city and we don't really put any emotions into those words like living in Vilnius, you know, we simply repeat certain uh, well-known academic phrases. So Luna, I would like to ask you how you came up with the idea of the, this Walls Remember intended uh, for the memory of Lithuanian Jewish community to bring back, to revive those memories of the Lithuanian Jewish community because they lived here, they built their lives here in, in our city. And this is uh, uh, how we start seeing the city differently, the, the lives of those people differently when you see those paintings on walls, those uh, murals. Uh, and how did you look for inspirations? Does it only focus on the Holocaust in particular? And I hope that people from various uh, towns and cities of Lithuania are watching us and our uh, debate is oriented also to the people who maybe have never visited Lithuania. Well, so many questions at the same time. I will start from the very beginning. You very rightly noted that Vilnius, uh, people of Vilnius are proud of multicultural city, 
they have learned certain phrases and keep repeating them, but often the facts they say lack emotion and also lack, lack background or proper knowledge. So maybe that was one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, initiate such a project and to call and invite people to learn more about the Jewish history through the language of arts. And this idea emerged rather organically. I'm uh, from Vilnius originally myself. I have been walking these streets all of my life. And I was interested in history. And this old town of Vilnius, to me, always provoked this awkward uh, feeling. I saw those signs of Jewish uh, legacy, uh, inscriptions. I knew uh, a little of history because my parents, uh, grandmother and father told me uh, about it because uh, they are also artists. So this Jewish Vilnius uh, still exists, but like in a different time perspective. As if we have now a different world, you know, and once there was a prosperous uh, Jewish world, which vanished uh, uh, mysteriously. And that knowledge, that feeling that there was something that has disappeared, brought me to this idea. And as an artist and as a person, I'm interested in re human relation with memory and the human relation with history. And I think that memory is very important for our society, for a mature society. And I have noticed that there are certain topics that are not very convenient, very not very comfortable to, to discuss. And if you start considering those topics, then you start feeling something and that does not always feel pleasant. So all these aspects brought me to this idea and it, it emerged naturally. I'm an artist myself and I wanted to talk in the language of arts. This is how, what I know and this is how I communicate. I had this naive idea that the art can help us tell serious stories and bring people closer to certain historical m moments and aspects to some painful uh, reflections. You also asked about the Holocaust. Uh, no. It's, I did not really focus on, on the Holocaust. I wanted to show a different, to represent different section. This project started uh, next to Vilnius and we, ha we talked about the Jewish community before uh, the World War II, which was a prosperous, uh, flourishing, uh, huge community. And there was uh, poverty and art and, and uh, intellectual development, but it is, was uh, very different and, and it contributed so well to the multicultural face of Vilnius. So this is what I wanted to focus on to this good feeling, to this liveliness. And uh, I wanted to bring closer the past and the present. Uh, and to, s to say that, you know, these um, drawings, those um, pieces of art on the street can uh, become a meeting place uh, for today's people and for the people of the past. And this is the challenge of the street art. It has different challenges to deal with uh, compared to the art, you know, that is exposed in galleries. It has to attract your attention right away uh, if we speak about art on the street. And to uh, promote this uh, greater engagement, we uh, also... Uh, introduced QR codes where you can uh, find all the information with the pictures, uh, with the background history, and all the other information. So it was a great discovery for us ourselves because we could feel and get this feedback, uh, this, uh, we could get the from, from, from people. One more question I have to ask. Your project has grown 
wide, uh, bigger. So it means it, it it was relevant and it was catchy enough. It it engaged people. It attracted people. So it was important in our daily life. And just like uh, the website Kyori Siena says, in, in, over the period of two years, the project was invited to become a part of Lithuanian regional identity and to uh, use the street art in smaller towns of Lithuania. So uh, did you create all those murals yourself with your colleagues or or this was a local initiative? Uh, well, and they did, the, the local artists did that in those small cities. No, in reality, local uh, social uh, activists contributed to implementing this initiative in other small towns. So cultural activists, uh, let's say in Merkine, we uh, cooperated with the museum. In Salante, we cooperated with the culture center. In Lutana, we cooperated with uh, the community uh, of Virovkina. Um, so those cultural activists and museums contributed a lot to themselves uh, to make this happen. And n there were no other artists employed in the project because it, this project is uh, an artistic project uh, based on a single idea. So we wanted to, to uh, keep this stylistic uh, unanimity. And... Uh, But the idea to work with other artists, to collaborate with other artists, still exists in my mind. So um, all the action, all the preparations, and all the development of ideas uh, was a team-based team activity. Mm. I could mention Merkine as well, where we cooperated with Estonians who helped us implement Based on my design, they uh, used a robot uh, to m do those drawings, uh, huge drawings on the walls. So, it, Lena, we are running out of time. I'm sorry. We could speak about this for for an hour. When I was reading about a robot, I thought I would go crazy. That was, seemed so unbelievable. But we have a, a possibility to see how our debate is received by the people. We have several questions. One of them is an encouragement for us to remember that we have Yulia with us because Zahor uh, show, TV show, documentary is very good and important one. Yulia, is your connection uh, uh, stable? Okay, we hear you well. So. Now, having received this encouragement, we would like to ask you to tell us why and who has come up with the idea to speak about the Litvak heritage in TV language in the format of the Zahor TV show, documentary TV show. So why did you find this project attractive and interesting? And, and because you assume this serious challenge is to start writing... Um, scenarios uh, uh, for for some of the episodes of this documentary so i know that the uh, right the job of the screen uh, screenplay a writer is one of the most important in, in in this documentary so please share your experience so many questions i will try to answer them all the beginning was uh, rather plain uh, i saw the, the same as had designated the, the year 2021 as the year of Vil Vilna Gaon. And I met my old colleague, TV producer, Indre Zalbaite Cesunene, and I said that it would be a wonderful opportunity to write an interesting project which would present the cultural heritage and culture in, in the television. I'm sorry, the sound uh, quality is not consistent. So she met with a couple of Jews who lived in Lithuania and we 
have worked on this project and she proposed to have such a project at the national uh, television. You know, if anyone had worked with the television, you know how the shows are produced and you never have time, you have to come up with the product very fast. So the first challenge was, um, just like for everyone, that was the um, coronavirus pandemic that hit uh, Lithuania as well as the entire world. We had to adapt very fast. We started, uh, we had to write down this, this um, screenplay very fast. We had to plan the sh uh, shootings and we had to work very quickly. And we he did this huge uh, um, work uh, with a wonderful team. For me personally, it was a challenge that when I started to learn about Jewish history, I knew very little about it indeed. Uh, my background is a journalist, uh, and probably this helped me learn as much as possible in a very short time and to uh, find people who could help you, professional people. Here I received a lot of uh, help from Lithuanian historians, and this is how we were working all the summer. Uh, we were writing the screenplays, we were uh, learning the history, and this is how we released this documentary. Uh, so please turn on uh, the, uh, Zahor next Monday. It will be intended for Sholei uh, City on the national TV. So I'm trying to be brief and quick because I know that there are many more questions. Yulia, one more question about the craftsmanship. During these uh, uh, documentaries, we heard a lot that it's not enough to discover a fact, but it is important of, uh, to see how those facts uh, uh, live, continue to live in our historical culture. So how could you respond to the question, how painful? stories, emotional stories, can be portrayed in, in TV shows so that they would encourage us to learn, uh, to uh, find out more about uh, certain stories. You know, um, some historians say, you know, history has to cause pain. This is why we write those uh, boring, long uh, history books. But what is your point of view? One of the objectives that we had to come up with a show. N nobody in the team, in the producer's team, was a historian. So we only consulted historians. Uh, so our task was, as TV producers, to uh, give inform to be well to create a, an informative and interesting show without uh, telling any nonsense. You know. So we had to trust, I'm sorry, the sound quality is poor again. So um, we also wanted to uh, present it uh, in a, without pity and without whining, you know, because it is often, you know, if this topic is referred to, it's often presented in a, with a certain negative uh, um, connotation. So, so we wanted simply to, tr to present it in an objective manner. Uh, we selected two actors uh, uh, walking uh, through the town as if having a tour and I think I'm sorry, but probably there are uh, certain problems due to internet connection. Unfortunately, we have to terminate this uh, question due to unstable internet connection. I ha we have to move on to uh, other questions. Yes, I see that people respond very uh, differently and we will not have enough time to discuss all the questions we only have five to seven minutes left to finalize everything that we have said but one question is very important so i will read this question immediately and in this panel 
We have been talking about remembrance sites and, and the good uh, experiences, but could you name the bad experience, exam bad examples? Zygmas, I think you are the only one who uh, is prepared to speak about this on the theoretical level. So what are those so-called bad experiences refer, uh, relating to uh, remembrance sites? Well, it depends on how we define what is that bad experience, where it, it wasn't effective, where it did not work, where it did not justify. Yes, probably where it did not work or it failed or... Let's say sometimes we build uh, uh, ugly monuments that we don't really want to look at. Well, um, some of them don't really provoke any emotions and are simply intended for, you know, people to come or certain Remembrance Day and to put flowers there or to place a stone. Yes, there are a number of places like this, but I couldn't tell or couldn't refer to them as, as negative experiences. Maybe we don't use the possibilities of those uh, Remembrance sites uh, to the fullest. So just like I said about those monuments in, in, in public spaces, I see an aspect of multiplying those monuments, so-called small monuments. Yes, I find them interesting. Yes, they attract some people, but how many more of them we will build, that is a question, you know. Yes, this multiplication aspect is as bad as you know marking certain tragic uh, uh, sites, such as you know here rests the reigns of, of of some Lithuanian citizens with tragic faith. So that is also one of the examples of the best of the bad uh, examples. I have already mentioned that I met Daiwa a year ago and I asked her the same question. And now to conclude the debate, I will try to remember that question. Next to Daiwa, there are other people who did not take part in, in this uh, uh, debate. In the old days, there was Lithuania where we had not only Jews, but uh, but Christians too. Then we had Jews who were surrounded with uh, uh, trees, and those trees were taken down to cities. Now we also have some Jews and the forest standing around. So can you tell me what we managed to do in 30 years of our independence? Zygmas Daiva Lina, I think we managed to do that because we inherited a very uh, rich uh, landscape, but we need to put certain highlights there. One of the living examples for me is the, the Sakura Garden that we have. That is a place, a monument, but it also functions as a public space uh, uh, for the city dwellers, I'm not sure if we could have even a better uh, access to, to the past, you know, or, and, and honoring the memory of, of um, some prominent people. We should look back to those uh, places. Mm which we try to, well, convert from, you know, some Soviet-era uh, monuments. We started building new ones. So maybe we should review them once again in an architectural perspective and etc. So I see this positive process because some 10 years ago, we only had very few road signs indicating where certain uh, remembrance sites are. Now we have many more of those road signs. So I think that the process uh, is taking place. And yes, I will add a couple of more sentences. We have planted many trees of memory, but 
if we use the metaphor of, of forests, we need to take care of the forest. There may be many trees, but not all of them will be fertile or not all of them will grow strong to be strong trees. So, um, uh, young people now feel the need to learn about their roots, to learn about their history that hasn't been uh, talked about uh, up till now and uh, how much focus we'll keep on the topic. I think it depends on our future generations. Will they take care of, of these topics, of the, those trees? Will they water them uh, sufficiently? <clears throat> I can only thank the participants of this debate, Daiva Tsitvarinia, Zygma Slutkus, Lina Šlepovic, Jutia Černauskenia, and Yulia Tsurupa. I'm very sorry that I could not ask all the questions we agreed in in preparation to this debate, but now we have to uh, pass this virtual platform to other participants of the next debate. Thank you very much for everyone who are watching this debate online. Please stay tuned and at three o'clock we will continue with the debate on continuity of the First Republic of Lithuania and the Restored Republic of Lithuania, nationality, personal rights, and Jewish heritage. Thank you very much. See you soon. Participants of the discussion, viewers of the discussion. My name is Egidius Shilekis. I am professor of Vilnius University, the Faculty of Law, and I'm honored to moderate the discussion in which we have uh, the lawyer, Faina Kuklanski, who is the chairwoman of the Lithuanian Jewish community also Professor Justinas Zielinskas, who represents Mikolas uh, Romneris University Law School, who is the competitor of this university. I'm trying to be, uh, I'm trying to joke here, but it's not uh, easy because the topic of the discussion is full of painful issues and is related to a very complex topic. continue to the First Republic of Lithuania and the Restored Repl Republic of Lithuania in terms of the nationality, personal rights, and Jewish heritage. Why is it so complex? Let me develop an introduction to the discussion. The regulation of the Jewish situation, especially in terms of the rights and freedoms is the decoration of the Lithuanian law making legislation. When the first Republic of Lithuania began uh, was uh, unique in terms of uh, the legislation of human rights and in comparison to other countries. Lithuanians seeking the acknowledgement of other countries de jure accepted, ex uh, accepted exceptional uh, commitments, international commitments, and uh, created a unique uh, uh, protection or standard of human rights, in particular protection in, in the context of protection of Jewish rights. It's difficult to imagine the minister without portfolio, but back then in the First Republic of Lithuania, we had a minister without portfolio, without a mandate for the Jewish affairs. Can you imagine today that next to the ministers of cultural energy, education, we would have a minister without portfolio, without mandate for Jewish affairs? So the the first regulate the first standards of regulation uh, was the golden standard in the Jewish context when the Lithuania issued 
a special legal regulation according to which Jews were taxed so that they pay taxes but for their own purposes and the state helps collect these taxes and uses the taxes not for for, for pressing for the pressure mechanisms but to help Jews where else can you find such a regulation if not in Lithuania in Europe it was non-existent so the national tax authority imagine would collect uh, taxes from Jews that were established by the Jews themselves so that uh, national autonomy affairs are financed. That's the golden age, a unique protection regulation. The second stage uh, is stagnation with the coming of the nationalist uh, Tautininke uh, party um, and uh, f f agriculture reform started. Imagine the Lithuanian state buys in dairy products, uh, produces uh, butter, exports it to England and is happy that uh, Jews are eliminated from this area. The third stage is the most tragic one, is relate and it is related to what the Supreme Council of the Republic of Lithuania, the uh, the Sema, the restorative Seimas, uh, indicated in the declaration. I'll quote uh, the statement of May the eighth of nineteen ninety regarding the genocide. Uh, of Jews uh, during the Hitler occupation of Lithuania. And I quote, the Lithuanian Supreme Council on behalf of the Lithuanian nation, and I emphasize, declares that that condemns and with a heartache uh, emphasizes that among the executioners we had Lithuanian citizens. In the fourth stage is uh, the restored uh, Republic of Lithuania, when the pain is uh, still alive, when there is no compassion, and we're trying to talk about discontinued continu continuity, so to say. So that would be my introduction and my mission as a moderator. And I would like now to refer to the to other panelists and to start the discussion on the topics such as nationality, uh, the dual nationality, or the nation a specific legal regulation of persons of the Lithuanian origin. It's not only related to nationality, but also to uh, restoration of property rights. We would uh, discuss the criminal code as well as um, other uh, sensitive issues uh, that can uh, that can be raised by anyone today. I'd like to now talk with lawyer Faina Kuklanski. Well, I hope that uh, we have listeners uh, not only among the Lithuanians but also by uh, people who live abroad, Jewish who work, uh, who live abroad, who, to whom this topic is very important, as well as politicians, the heads of uh, the Lithuanian government, who probably have not taken such a big interest in this topic, but they should. I'd like to say that this, uh, that the speakers, uh, the panelists b before us, uh, uh, were very positive, uh, and everybody talks about what has been done, what they have uh, done, and usually. They would demonstrate examples of good practice. Our mission 
is a bit more complex. We're going to talk about what has not yet been done in the country. And I think, and probably what you, this is also what you think, uh, that's something that has to be done. For these things to happen, for, th for, things, for these things to be done, we need political will or decisions of the SEMAS. And SEMAS is elected by people. So it's important that we are heard and we are understood by our listeners. Speaking of the nationality and restoration of property rights, dual nationality, multiple nationality. I'd like to start with the restitution or the restoration of property rights. This painful issue has not been solved for a number of years. As long as we have independent Lithuania, as long as this issue this is not is not solved. And that refers to people, and that is the most painful, uh, who were deported to the concentration camps, who did not come back to Lithuania because they had nowhere to come back to. Their whole property was nationalized. The family members were killed. As, and as in the movie Schindler's List, the last stage, people are standing and they have nowhere to go uh, when they leave uh, the concentration camp. Where do they have to go? To, to their historic, historical uh, nation of Israel, country of Israel. Although Israel was not existent then, back then, it was Palestine. So, but people decided to have a country. Can we condemn them for that? Is it not normal? behavior. I think the behavior of our state is not normal. So that the issue of property rights restitution is not yet solved, as well as the issue of people who of a Jewish origin who were exiled to Siberia, who were big industrialists, um, and in comparison to other nationalities uh, that were exiled to Siberia, Jews made up a big proportion. They received uh, uh, a permission to come back to Lithuania around the 70s, and when they had the opportunity to go to Israel, that's what they did. According to the law of nationalities back then in Lithuania, that were in effect up to 2006, they were referred to as repatriates. Although then the big question is where their fatherland is, and then the constitutional law decided that this law contradicts constitution. However, their property situation has not changed because they missed the terms to apply for the restoration of, uh, of property rights. The Supreme Administrative Court has expressed their opinion as well as the Supreme Court and the Constitutional Court, which very clearly emphasized that applications to restore the property have to be submitted by citizens at by the deadlines established. These persons don't even have the possibility uh, to go to court uh, for the extension of the deadline to apply for the property rights restoration. If we look at this problem from, uh, from international practice and theory, these victims are referred, as to, referred to as neglected victims, so, or, the, or the victims that do not deserve, deserve uh, uh, the property restoration, because na uh, the systems are created in countries in such a way that it is impossible to exercise the right to apply for the property restoration. And here we have to refer to international uh, legal acts uh, on restitution. 
They are not non-binding uh, legal acts. Resolution of international organization becomes soft law, non-binding law. The countries are only encouraged to uh, indemnify, but they don't uh, have to do that. So here we see differences between the international law and the national law. However, in Europe, we see the practice, the tendency that the countries themselves may take the commitment to uh, return the property or to compensate uh, the victims for illegally nationalized property. I'd like to emphasize that the Jewish property was nationalized in a different way than in than the, than the property of uh, other uh, national groups. And we can see that very clearly from national acts. And if we consider provisional government the, the government, then the property from Jews was taken away in 1940 during the first Soviet occupation. In the 19 in 1941, the law on denationaliz denationalization adopted by the provisional government clearly speaks about the fact that the whole property is returned to those uh, from whom it was taken, except for Jews. Russians were also included, but then they were crossed crossed out. And in 1942, Reich uh, announced that the, all Jewish property is their property. So when are we going to approach the historic justice when neglected victims will not be neglected? I would like to continue the idea of uh, Professor Schleikis uh, um, of golden age. Roma wrote very interestingly about that in his book, The State. And Romerus, when he was talking about the, uh, about the Jews in his monograph, he wrote, and I quote, this relationship, uh, the relationship with this nation is uh, exceptional in Europe without having uh, their own uh, country, their own land, uh, and this nation were only, thanks to their people, managed to preserve their identi and identity through thousands of years, and they resisted assimilation in other countries, and I'm talking about Jews. By living in Europe for two thousands, they don't have that special territorial center. Um, Jews have, were also influenced by the, by the countries, the territories they lived in, such as Lithuanians. So uh, speaking of nationality, I'm not going to mention the referendums and people uh, who left uh, Lithuania during the independence uh, and lost their uh, nationality. The restoration of property rights is an uh, integral part of nationality. And if obstacles are made, uh, or if the laws are adopted, or the law, if, if the law is enforced in a way that it's impossible to enforce it, and if it's impossible to restore the nationality, this problem becomes even more complex. And I don't know if, uh, if we're going to see such government in Lithuania, which is going to be brave enough and solve this issue. We only need political will. We only need not to be afraid of. And to, re to give tribute to the nation that disappeared in this territory. As far as I understand, the constitutional issue is rather simple. If Jews were not discriminated, and uh, if they could, just like uh, people of Lithuanian descent uh, to have dual citizenship, many of them would have filed their applications to, uh, for um, restitution, which is only granted for um, 
citizens only. But as the law uh, prevented many of, 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 of Jews uh, to do this, you know, and many of them did not really want to refuse their uh, Israeli uh, citizenship. So as, as, as the expert of administrative and civil uh, law, I, I understand, as far as I understand, the um, restitu when the restitution started and the deadline was set, people then had to have the right or had to be entitled to do something. Since you did not have the, that right then, and the Constitutional Court only opened uh, the right to for those repatriated uh, in 2006, it was too late already because the restitution process does not last forever. So, so the question B is in terms of those people who were active, wh whether they did not they f did not have this opportunity to do this because of this or because of uh, legislators' fault, because. There was a reservation for Lithuanian uh, citizens who could make use of this reservation, and they could have uh, uh, the citizenship of Canada or the United States and Lithuania uh, 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 at the same time. So when, when the Constitutional Court removed this possibility for repatriation and the restitution process was on, already underway, Courts star stopped defending those people who asked to be treated as citizens, first of all, and then who wanted to defend their rights to restitution. I can only guess that maybe Constitutional Court was scared to provide this uh, interpretation of the Constitution just the way it did in 2006 because uh, the restitution process would have taken so much longer than then it is, is my only spec it is only my speculation but i agree that uh, the uh, property right is 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 a civil right not only uh, the right of a citizen it is a human right so be, this is where those uh, painful issues emerge when only the citizens were granted, uh, were entitled for restitution. Let's say if I leave for Australia, uh, that is no problem. If the Jew mm, mm, left for Australia, He's one kind of, of Jew. If the Jew left for Israel, he's different kind of, of a Jew or citizen, you know. Or those who left uh, for Germany or the Poles who left for Poland are also treated in a negative manner. So this is something painful. Mm. But without the legislators' interference, who would come up with a new rule, we cannot deal with this situation. I'm not sure that the courts uh, could come up with certain rules because the rules only enforce uh, laws. Certainly, the courts could have asked for another interpretation uh, and explanation of the constitutional court. Mm. I would like to ask Justinus uh, to say his view of uh, how do you see this... Uh, restitution phenomenon in Lithuania. Thank you uh, for the floor and thank you for inviting me to this debate. I even have a broader perspective on this issue. In, in modern day discussion, I see an interesting aspect uh, which relates to approach that uh, um, Nationalization, nas nationalization of asset is as scary as deportations, shootings, and a loss of property, you know, seem to be some kind of a conditional uh, uh, aspect where different ref reservations arise. Something what I uh, have observed in similar debates is in reservation that the assets were appropriated, 
by the Soviet Union and uh, Germany, but not Lithuania. Uh, Foina briefly mentioned this. So I find it awkward that there are people who give this as an argument and they don't really see that, okay, it was uh, uh, appropriated by, by Germany and the Soviet Union and, and uh, because Lithuania could not really implement uh, any uh, decisions. Uh, and the Soviet Union did not really pay any attention. They, they, they did whatever they liked in this uh, point. So here I get a question. Why people don't really see that these two things are equal? Lithuanian property was also expropriated by the Soviet Union. So if these properties of Lithuanians were re re uh, restored, uh, so why don't we provide the same possibility for Jews? It's sim simply injustice. And then I get the question whether this injustice is ethni uh, ethnicity-based. And that is a problem which does not relate uh, to uh, legal environment alone, but also relates to our social environment, to our understanding what property is, how it is seen. And I will go to another part of our debate where we will talk about, when we, let's say, talk about Jonas Norika. You hear that, you know, he did not really kill, uh, kill Jews and he only uh, took the property. You know, taking away people's property and managing it, who would like that someone would come and took your property away? Nobody would like that. So this... Uh, awkward inability to understand that it all is all related and it should be uh, not attributed to nationality but to overall approach to a pe person as a citizen that is the main painful issue I will briefly remind you that repatriation issues were mentioned and very rightly so but we also have this problem of uh, uh, citizenship laws and they all have a similar problem like the Vilnius region uh, the problem that we have in the Vilnius region because in the Vilnius region this regulation was very unclear uh, uh, to what extent those laws were applicable in, in Vilnius region? Are we only talking about the territory that was recognized in 1939 or is it a territory that was recognized in 1920? So it turns out that people who lived in the in Vilnius region they still have the same issues, the citizenship issues to deal with if they are not ethnic Lithuanians. So I think this question needs to be taken seriously by our state. I would like our state to have sufficient strength to address this issue so that all the citizens uh, are treated equally. And Egidius is the, uh, a better uh, expert of constitutional law than me. Uh, what do you think? Could this issue uh, reconsidered again by a appealing the constitutional court on individual uh, um, claim? Well, I would seriously doubt this because the, resti uh, the restitution uh, model on a narrower um, scope. Well, only citizens, and uh, ha I entitled only to the surviving or remaining uh, uh, real estate. That uh, kind of regulation model was accepted as uh, non contradictory to the Constitution. And the European Court of uh, um, Human Rights also recognized that the European Human Rights Convention did not really defend the right for restitution. But if a state chooses such a regulation model where restitution of uh, um, citizens' rights uh, is possible, then 
it has to be made clear uh, what, that they have a right to appeal to court, that they uh, have a right to defend their restitution rights, and etc. So this is not really new, but the main point or the main question is, unfortunately, it was already 20, year 2020, so uh, as far as I understand, in the constitutional perspective, my state has uh, mm, mm, made it complicated to receive Lithuanian citizenship by maintaining the citizenship of, let's say, Israel. Because Lithuanian nationals could or were entitled to dual citizenship according to the law on citizenship of 2002, which was um, recognized by constitutional court as contradictory. But if they were entitled to Lithuanian citizenship and Israeli citizenship at the same time, if they were entitled to that, they could have filed for restitution back then. But when the deadlines were hit, the Constitutional Court recognized the regulation of uh, citizenship as contradictory to the Constitution, and those individuals acquired the right to get the citizenship of Lithuania at the same time as they held the citizenship of is Israel. And then they lost the administrative battle because the argument was that the deadline was over to file the application. And nobody even questioned whether the person missed uh, this deadline because of his or her fault, even though you know he or her were walking from door to door for 20 years. And they were only told that if you want to restore your property rights, you you have to refuse your Israeli citizenship. So I probably think there are too few of Jews who would really want to restore their property rights um, at the expense of, of their Israeli citizenship. So I think this is the great pain that many Jews feel. I'm not sure what Afina has to add. You know, there's life, people. Uh, they are elderly, they are at a certain age already, those who survived war, they, those who were uh, in the concentration camps, they were elderly people in 91, 92 already, so they had to think of how they will live, of, of you know, refusing the citizenship of, of, of the country they live in. Will they get their retirement benefits? Will they get the, any uh, social benefits? And if they will be able to uh, restore their property rights, it, the same thing applies to Lithuanians. It's not only, you know, uh, submitting an application. This means you have to fight legal battles for 10 years to pay your lawyers and etc. So there, and in the end, you still get no guarantees. <laughs> At the same time, we have sentiments, you know, we have emotions. Uh, many elderly people, uh, those uh, shabby houses saw as, as, as the king's palace, you know, because they wanted those shabby houses where they grew up, where they were raised, where they had their childhood memories, where their parents, brothers and daughters lived and maybe shot down in, in the very same shabby house. So we had to... Uh, understand what, let's say, what compensation we would pay to Frankel. Would we pay him 1,000 or 3,000 euros when he maintained all of the Lithuanian economy? What about the brothers Israeli? What about the silver factory? Mm. And mm, th that is a huge scope. Uh, mm. We can agree on a certain symbolic amount, but this, as a state, please show some compassion, some empathy, not only in your words. You know, the Zahor documentary is a lovely show, and you know, the show villages where Jew, Jews have vanished without leaving a trace by only leaving their houses. 
So we have to think of this somehow in th after 30 years. I think that is quite possible. If someone was taken away to the <clears throat> concentration camp, he or she left there, not because oh, he or she was very happy or if the people uh, were evacuated. Uh, evacuation is eviction, you know, because the people were simply forced to do that and they had no choice, you know, no other choice. That is great historic injustice. If we want to talk uh, proudly of our state, uh, and Jews are truly loyal to the state of Lithuania, uh, we would ask to ensure proper le legislation, to ensure equality, and uh, to, ha to ensure the same rights as local ethnic uh, nationals have. Uh, even the constitution is even based on ethnic uh, Lithuanian, well, nationality. This is how the constitution starts, you know, uh, we the Lithuanian nation. Sometimes, you know, I get lost who I am. Am I a Jew? Am I uh, uh, a Lithuanian? Am I... Uh, uh, Am I a, a Jew a, of Lithuanian descent or am I a Lithuanian of Jewish descent? Who would be, uh, who would I be if I lived in Switzerland, let's say? So I know that I'm Jew, I'm a, I am a Jew. But uh, if I am a Lithuania, according to the law, I'm still not mm, sure. Thank you very much. These are very sensitive issues because a lot of Lithuanians imagine that Jews um, accumulated uh, property that they are taking away. You mentioned Frankel and other business people. What they created is uh, in Lithuania. This uh, this is the these are the things that is left in Lithuania, as Mr. Bumblauskas uh, emphasizes Baroque churches, which is the element of the Lithuanian identity, and this. Identity, as he says, is not of the, of the, the, uh, the Orthodox churches of um, in the shape of an onion. So, if uh, Li Lithuania, uh, if we talk about, let's say, uh, national re uh, natural resources. What are these natural resources? They, they are scarce in Lithuania. We, but we, what, what do we have? We have Jews, the Jews, the value of whom is great. The societies uh, which invited Jews would, would flourish. Who wrote uh, invitation letters for Jews to come to the territory of Lithuania? The kings of Lithuania, the, the Dan Grand Dukes of Lithuania. I grew up in the Salakas, which had a very strong community of Jews. Uh, I then lived in Švenčionieli, um, which still has the cemetery of Jews. Um, um, I finished school in Pan Pandelis, and uh, there is a huge t cemetery of Jews. So everybody of us who considers himself or herself as Lithuanian, We're all related to Jews, and this painful moment that Faina has mentioned. Uh, I, I looked at the law up to 19, up to 1990, uh, March the 11th. The citizens who fled Lithuania and their um, and their grandchildren may be entitled to dual citizenship, nationality. The exception goes to those who fled to the former Soviet Union territories. Jews uh, who were afraid of losing their lives uh, uh, fled to Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia. They are considered to have fled to 
to former Soviet Union territories. But when we say Lithuania was occupi occupied uh, on the 15th of June 1940, and we imagine that, and we imagine, let's say, those who were citizens, and, though, uh, and those who went, uh, went to the West, Canada, for example, Australia, Israel, America, everything is okay. But if you have fled to the former Soviet territories, then you're trapped. And Faina talked about this. Maybe I was evacuated. My, uh, my, my parents, for example, they might have been Marxist, but uh, for example, as a child, as maybe uh, I was ev evacuated. So is this a situation going to be problematic? Faina, is that what you refer to, the problem of evacuated people? I'm sorry, Faina's microphone is off. Those people who um, um, managed to flee by miracle in 1941, and not necessarily communists or Marxists, uh, these were the people, let's say, uh, Nor Norvelis, Mr. Norvelis, uh, who was the uh, the director of the Frankel's uh, factory, and she, he was murdered in Konas, and he left five children in Cholet, and these five children, they managed to jump on the train, and they uh, flee to Russia. Of course, they ended up in Kazakhstan, and they were taken, and the men, men were taken to army, but they came back to Lithuania. So these evacuated people who were saving their lives, are they referred to people who have fled to Russia and Soviet Union? Of course, they evacuated because they had no other choice. Others could, would also have fled, but uh, the walls were closed. You couldn't do that. You, you just became, and uh, you lost your rights in one day. Of course, continuing uh, Norika, we can talk about Krishtaponis and Barzda. Yes, they uh, organized the prophecy of uh, Jews, uh, and they were in ghettos, where this property came from. This, this is because uh, people were put into ghettos and their uh, property was managed by the local administration. It's it, out of question. And uh, I'm not a moderator, but I would like to ask uh, Professor Zielinskas. You are aware of uh, the fact that IRA and European Commission have adopted declarations uh, on rehabilitation, on and on fighting anti-Semitism, on denying Holocaust and, and denying and de distortion of Holocaust. How, what is the reaction of our government to these declarations? In general, in Lithuania, is anyone aware? I mean, does anyone talk about these declarations? Are they disseminated? Are they discussed? Um, does anyone talk about the fact that they need to be incorporated into the law system? Not only law system, but it, it covers everything. The last declaration that was adopted on the 2nd of December, it covers all areas, including education and other, other, other areas. So are we, a members, are we members of European Union or not? Is it only me who takes part in this commission, in these commissions as a... Uh, as a representative of NGO, do you have people from the government who should react, who, who should uh, translate all these messages to society about the policy of the European Union, European Commission? Thank you for your question. Um, I will just simply say uh, to the to the listeners, because not, not everybody knows what IRA is. IRA is an international organization 
I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at the Lithuanian translation. Uh, it's the International Alliance on Holocaust Memory. Uh, it's um, uh, an international organization that is dedicated to the research and studies of the, of the uh, tragedy. And it uh, unites a lot of countries. I'm not talking about the European Union. Uh, all members of the European Union uh, are part of it. And also uh, countries uh, where um, Holocaust did not take place are also members of it. For example, uh, um, also these countries where, for example, Jews uh, ran, fled to, fled to uh, and this organization is a, 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 um, an old organization. Um, You, uh, you men uh, you've, uh, Faina mentioned uh, documents, international documents, such as guidelines, recommendations. Well, in international law, uh, there is a common uh, problem that uh, documents adopted by international organizations do not or not always have imperative power. The, uh, their enforcement is mm, the discretion of the states. And IRA and declarations adopted by IRA, um, well, on the one hand, the representatives of our government so far uh, have been participating in the meetings and the working groups of uh, IRA. Um, I've, I've also participated in them as 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 an as a representative of university, not not the government, of course. And in 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 general, when it comes to declarations, the area of declarations should. through uh, mechanisms of uh, respecting international law, because Lithuania in its constitution uh, is committed to respect uh, and uh, take commitments according to the international law. And uh, especially when it comes to declarations and documents that um, directly are related to the Lithuanian society. So what, what specifically is done with these declarations? As far as I have seen, um, well, I've seen in the foreign uh, ministry, the foreign, foreign affairs ministry that IRA has adopted one or another declaration. Uh, when it comes to rehabilitation issue, IRA invites uh, to um, focus on rehabilitation problem, um, rehabilitation of people who have, uh, of people who are, might be related to the catastrophe. So um, I haven't noticed that in the public, uh, uh, and that's, that's bad. It's bad that we don't see this information. It doesn't reach us. And I think that Lithuania should develop or at least to activate certain legal mechanisms uh, which uh, could help us refer to such documents. I sometimes notice the trend that when uh, in Lithuania issues are discussed that have a strong context uh, of international law, our national institutions uh, really uh, refer very little to international law. And if we could encompass international law to a larger extent, if we uh, took recommendations of international organizations into account, everything would be much better. Our state would seem, would have a better image. Um, uh, when I participated in IRA meetings several times, I think uh, I think that the representatives of Lithuania are more preoccupied in IRA that that they have to defend themselves from what is being discussed in IRA about Lithuania instead of uh, taking positive steps uh, ahead, so that there is nothing to defend. Uh, 
four uh, in, in, in IRA meetings. I think the situation is uh, needs uh, changes. And all these nice declarations that we often talk about, let's say, we often say that Lithuania has a good relationship with Israel, that we respect uh, the Jewish element of society. But when it comes to these very um, acute issues, uh, uh, you mentioned the, 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 the Krikštaponis monument. It's bad. It's bad that it, that it exists. And a rehabilitation declaration. I mean, it would be a possibility to raise this issue once again and to see how what, what happened with the rehabilitation uh, at the beginning of 1990. If everything was done correctly back then, whether rehabilitation back then, uh, uh, on um, based on the mass principle, is it is it really just? Is it really because we always uh, have to refer to the principle of justice? But so far, um, um, I haven't seen um, lo lo looking at the situation through the eyes of an ordinary citizen. I don't see any changes, uh, and uh, I only. Uh, I can only express regret and to, to, to hope that the state is going to pay more attention to that. Because you said very, uh, you, 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 you said very correct words. Where, where do we go with these declarations? So we have to talk about declarations. If we talk about them, maybe, maybe some, somebody will pay attention to that. And these declarations will, uh, will become implemented. Thank you very much. I have to respond and to encourage uh, to see positive things. Well, the golden age has not come back. Uh, I mean, uh, the first state of Lithuania. Uh, the continuity is ensured because uh, in the area of human rights, Lithuania has advanced, uh, has progressed a lot. I wouldn't say that there are Jews in Lithuania who would feel uh, legal insecurity. There will, will have painful moments, but as a moderator, I have to mention that the Lithuanian Seimas um, is uh, way ahead of the Lang uh, Poland uh, Seimas uh, because it uh, has uh, adopted the uh, law on the goodwill compensation for religious communities' properties. I'm not going to discuss about the amounts. In liters, it was 128 million euros, and euros, it's around 37 million euros, but that's not the point. Uh, we have uh, shown... Uh, we have shown attention and we, as a state of 3 million, we are ahead of uh, Poland with the population of 30 million, which has e hasn't even started the discussions uh, of, of this uh, a similar law. Another document which is very important uh, is uh, the letter of uh, the Lithuanian Supreme Council to uh, Dovas Shulanskis, Israel's Knesset. Uh, 26th of uh, June 1940. Uh, we talked about Noriega several times, we mentioned him several times, who is related to, uh, to, to this painful moment because he collaborated with Nazis. So how does this letter begin? So this letter begins, uh, uh, this letter is of, sorry, of 1990. Uh, so, so the letter opens up with, dear chairman, I would, re I, I, I thank you, I sincerely thank you for your letter. So Dova Shilanskas wrote the letter first. We are honored that you, as a pat patriot of Lithuania who comes from Shole, who sang Lietuva Tevinia Mus, our national anthem, and then going through all the cycles of the catastrophe, today are one of the first, uh, one of the Im most important men of uh, the state of Israel. What are other or words? Your pain is 
my pain because we have so because we have lost so many innocent lives because my people from my country participated in the killings and that my nation in 1940 1941 has lost has lost its statehood and was not able to reduce a holocaust uh, or or to to resist it so Shole is mentioned again Dovas Shalanskis is from Shole as Frenkel is as well as Norika very interesting very interesting uh, moments well, first of all, I have to say that Dobas is my uncle. It's not my blood uncle. My mother and his uh, wife uh, were cousins. Uh, they grew up uh, in Shole, and uh, uh, the, Dobas uh, has deceased already, but and his family is very close to us. I didn't know about this letter, and I'm very happy that this letter was written. And um, I would really like to thank uh, Mr. Landsbergis for, for, for this letter. I remember when Dovas came to Lithuania. Um, the tragedy, well, what has been good and um, what is good? Well, we cannot cover everything with uh, with, with, with the Holocaust. All my family lives abroad. Um, my, uh, the brother and sister of my father, uh, uh, until their death, the most beautiful uh, place in Lithuania was in Vesia, next to the Lake Ancha. That was their fatherland, that, that, that was their home, their lake, their childhood. And they wanted nothing more than to come back to the Lake Ancha. For my mother, uh, Shole was her uh, homeland. Um, uh, she, uh, they, they had a mill, and uh, and they, 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 they uh, were a part of uh, life in Shole, uh, which was terminated. What happened? Well. We have to accept what happened, but we have to cherish the historical memory. And if a country respects itself, respects itself, and if it declares its democracy and that it respects uh, the rights of all people, actually, the Lithuanian Jewish community is one of the founders of the Lithuanian oh, of the Human Rights Coalition. We are very active. Uh, in the defense process of human rights, uh, we're very compassionate for other n national minorities. And uh, we and we uh, we also uh, we well. And, and it's, uh, on the eve of Hanukkah, I can say that for all national communities, we have sent Hanukkah gifts. Mm, those are donuts. So we showed signs of attention. Uh, we we have so many different nationalities in Lithuania living together, and I'm very happy to have this conference. We have talked about history and history as we all know is not a, like a chronicle it's a science today historians uh, um, they express their ideas um, we had a lot of artists we had a lot of uh, um, researchers, lawyers, the elite of lawyers who had the possibility to express their ideas and thoughts in terms of the constitutional law and we should not be afraid 
That's the philosophy of the crowd. We should not be afraid. We have to have, to have the, our own convictions. We have to have knowledge. We have to talk. And I think that this conference, as today's conference, unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of time to talk about the criminal code and the concept of genocide. Were you, Professor Agidius, you could probably, you, you would have comments. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to, to, for that. But if we feel that the conference is a, a successful one, and if it gives food for thoughts for lawyers, for people who are not related to law, to historians, artists, society, I think then we will be able to organize conferences in the future. Life never stops, never stops. Laws will be changed and amended. And I, I hope that after this conference, uh, uh, somebody from the government will react and will think about amendments to certain laws. I think that um, we'll have more knowledge uh, in terms of uh, history. People will become more historically aware. Unfortunately, we didn't have the possibility to uh, invite law historians, and that would be very interesting, because uh, Lithuanian uh, law, uh, Lithuanian, uh, the, the, the history of the Lithuanian Jews' law is very interesting, and it could have, and except for Rodelunas, I don't know any law historians. We have maybe several um, his, law historians at the moment, but we couldn't, um, we didn't manage to invite them. So there, there are so many topics uh, related to Jews, and we have few Jews in Lithuania, but a lot of topics. So we could talk on and on and discuss. But since we have seven minutes left, maybe the moderator has some, some, some questions. Uh, uh, and, and maybe we could use those seven minutes. Uh, um, I thank all the I thank the conference uh, participants for for being present. Let's use these seven minutes for um, for the discussion. You're muted, Eustinus. Uh, can you make some conclusive remarks? It is always difficult to wrap up the debate. We have discussed and touched upon many issues, but there are still many issues that we haven't uh, addressed. Thomas says that the time is up. Are we still online or not? But I will briefly tell what I have to say. Any understanding starts with, con with a conversation. Uh, if we speak of cultural, historical understanding or legal understanding, uh, no matter what uh, we talk about, be it uh, criminal code, citizenship, or Article 170, which is often the only measure when we have to fight with uh, the hate language, the hatred speech, which often is targeted against Jews in Lithuania. and. Uh, we have very few Jews in Lithuania, and those who express negative opinions, uh, well, so I'm happy that we had this forum, we had this debate, and that it was focused on, in, on expanding our intellectual perspective. So I would really call everyone to listen to this uh, debate. And I hope that we will get back to this legal debate sometime in the future. Thank you very much for this opportunity to participate. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Our time is up.
I would like to sincerely thank everyone, and I hope that the legislators and the politicians will take into account those grievances and those painful issues that were unresolved. Thank you.